What's going on with all the cigars? Uh, which cigars? Those are not cigars. Those are marijuana. Oh, okay. I figured it might be something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's marijuana on the outside. It's called a blunt. That's what the youngins call it. It's oh, tobacco. no, I know the term blunt, but yeah, that looks okay. like a legit. I thought it was well, like a little You're younger some than kind. me. Of course you, you know it. Yeah, Talking, I'm not like as schooled old. as you. I'm not as schooled <laughs> as you in the illicits. Even though that's not, it, it's not an illicit now. Speaking oh. of illicit, we've got some meat eater bourbon, some elk shank bourbon. Yeah, it pairs with. It's a good name. It pairs with beaver tail. Pairs with beaver tail. <laughs> elk shank. I've, I've elk had shank. both of those things thanks to you. <laughs> elk shank's a great name for it because that is like one of the rare foods. Like if you talk to most hunters, like I said, have you ever had elk shank, asabuco? Yeah. They'd be like, what? Most most hunters have never eaten that. No, but it, and it was revelatory to find out about it. And then it's the thing that uh, I became, I started to proselytize, you know. I found out about eating it because my brother found out about eating it because he has this old cookbook called the L.L. Bean. It's like the L.L. Bean Wild Game Cookbook um, by a guy named Angus. First name of Angus, if I remember right. And he's got a shank, like he's got a shank recipe in his book for antelope shank. And so we started making it. That, that's the funny thing about wild game cooking that you've probably picked up on is that you could uh, you could have a thing where you could say like, hey, here's a recipe for a white-tailed deer heart, right? And someone would be like, but do you have one for a mule deer heart? Have I explained this to you before? No. Well, they're interchangeable, aren't they? Well, that's yeah, that's the thing. So obviously, like when we did our cookbook, I tried really hard to steer away from things that would be elk recipes, deer recipes, and just take it from a cut basis. Your cookbook is excellent. By Have the way. you messed around with many it? times? Oh, that's many good. times. That's, that's great. Quite a few things from it. It's really great. Um, we got away from saying that, like, here's an antelope recipe or, or whatever, because it's just like the cut is more important, especially with all these ungulates, like horned and antlered game. What it is is more important than what it came from. So. By putting elk shank on that bottle, I'm kind of like going against my own advice. But if I just put shank, people might not know what you're talking about. Well, it could be like lamb shank, but it's just a cool name. We're going to do a limited run of those where we write all kinds of weird stuff in there that it pairs well with. Is it good? Is this good stuff? Should we yeah, try man. it? It's five years old. Should we get a taste? Yeah. All right, let's get a, get get some ice and some glasses. Because, you know, I took, a long, a I took a long break from drinking. Ooh, how long? Uh, well, I just slowed way down on it. When my kids were born, started to be born, and then gradually, me and my wife have gotten back into it. <laughs> gradually, together. you know what she? Clink. <laughs> yeah. No, you know we haven't. Well, you guys to- are working together. Yeah. Right, which is really crazy. I know we haven't toasted. Giannis took a year off booze. Wow. For no, just for like whatever Giannis reasons. Uh, whatever Giannis, I-, I can't remember. He had some reason for it. Uh, he had a birthday once and took a month off. Then he had a birthday and took a year off. He's got four mm-hmm. months to go. For the end of the year, and then he's going to drink? Yeah, but he says his family, I, I think his wife was explaining to me, um, there's a lot more disposable income around the house now, because she's like, I never realized. How much boozing <laughs> takes up? Yeah, well, How much all those fancy beers adds, <laughs> what all those fancy beer adds up to. That's an interesting thing, yeah. People don't think about that. When you run your tab at the end of the week, and then add that times four, and then add that times 12, that's real money. Yeah, and I don't know if you remember... Uh, you probably liked this when you were younger, where like it was, it was just, uh, it was an impossible that you'd have leftover booze in your house. Do you know? Because everybody just drank so much. Right, right, right. You didn't, like yeah. now we're like such grown ups in our pantry. We have like a little liquor section. Right. And you have like, oh, there's, you know. Yeah, I have a wine fridge. Yeah. But when in I the old days, it, you couldn't because you just drank it and it was gone. Right. You know? Was... Yeah. Uh, can I want to interview you. I want to interview you for a minute. Okay, go ahead. How comfortable do you ever tell your listeners about um, about the comedy stuff you're working on, or do you yeah. like to keep a big secret? Yeah, I, I tell them some things. I don't like to give up premises. Cheers, sir. You don't like to give up premises. I mean uh, punchlines. And, you know, oh. I'll say like a subject I'm working on. You, you know, do or don't I, give up subjects. Well, I, well, I want to I engage you about a subject that we were texting about. Oh, about the uh, yeah. the missionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, sure. I just don't understand. This is good. I know that you will. I like it. I know that you will have, uh, I, knowing you and how good you are at what you do, I know you'll have done it, but I don't understand how you could have had a novel thought about the missionary. Yes. Yeah, who this, got killed. Just to, just to refresh only, people's memory, there's, a, yeah. there's an island. 
East Sentinel. What's funny about my fish shack, there's an island called Sentinel Island. Really? Yeah. No one lives on it. Um, I've been past it many times and have yet to been shot at. It's North Sentinel Island. Oh, it was North, sorry. North Sentinel Island. It's in the middle at, of the at Indian my, Ocean. And my shack is East, East Sentinel. Sentinel. <laughs> sorry. North Sentinel Island. Yeah, I you, go you know it better, so you should tell people what it is. I want to go to your shack. I, I would love to have you there. Halibut. Really? Let's, yeah, let's let's it, next one instead of a hunting trip, let's do a fishing trip. I would love to have we'll you have up there. Have Callan come out there and we'll catch some halibut. So you would you're not interested in bringing your family? Yeah, we could do that too. We kind of take a family approach up okay. there more and more now. Well, uh, your kids are you like done flipping over rock, your kids like flipping rocks and seeing what's youngest, under the rock. My youngest loves fishing. Yeah. Loves it. Rock she goes, flipping. She loves everything. She's okay. she's really big in that. How world. young's the youngest? 9. Oh. Yeah, perfect. But uh, no, I want to get like I just can't. I can't. I've I, I I've thought about it and thought about it, and I can't think. Not that I don't have faith in you, I just can't think of what yeah, the take we, would be. The, the problem is, if I explained it, what the take is, it would fuck up the bit for people that haven't seen the bit. I'll show it tonight. Tonight, no, I'm see. going tonight. Yeah. I can't wait to go see. You, but I just You'll wanted to. I'll explain off air. I'll explain off air. Okay. Yeah. Are you feeling good about the bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fascinating subject you know the guy uh commander maurice vidal portman you know who that guy is no <clears throat> he was the uh the pervert that traveled around from island to island uh measuring guys and taking weird photos with oh, them dressing yeah, them up yeah. like roman soldiers i read the i read a big piece about this which i actually sent to you to see if you'd read it too yeah i'd yeah. read uh, uh you said you read everything about it yeah i'd read quite a few things about it because there was a guy on twitter his name is respectable law at respectable law and he posted a whole series of things he had, he had actually been studying this case or this this place before because mm -hmm. of this pervert guy and so when this man uh this missionary showed up on that island and got yeah. murdered like he knew all about the history of this island so he made like a chain of posts on twitter which were really interesting and formative and then i started going deep into it and i read the guy's journals the journals were hilarious man like the, kid, the kid that got killed no the guy oh, the who guy. was the the pervert the english the, the english pervert in the 1800s probably wrecked like that whole area for those people because they had this idea of what white men are. Now, these people don't have a written language, and they, they just have stories. So they probably still have stories of these white men that come carrying diseases and want to touch your dick and measure them. Yeah, so this is a guy. He was into – I just want to make sure I remember this right. He was into, like, skull morphology but with sexual organs. Well, he was – it's hard to tell what he was into, but it was – it's so obviously perverted – like it's it seems like he was doing sexual stuff with these people, trying to legitimize it by yeah, I mean like yeah, just measuring them and 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 doing detailed descriptions of their sex organs and yeah, he was really into that. That seemed very important to him. And he sur <laughs> he sur he survived the island. I can't yeah. decide which to go with my new uh, my new Laird Hamilton turmeric coffee or the whiskey. Or the Mix it up back and forth. Yeah, it's back really interesting. Forth. It's like it's like soup. Yes. With yeah. coffee in it. It's very good for you, too. Like I said, that turmeric, you know, people think of it as curry because it's a great spice for food, but it's a, it's a, a potent anti-inflammatory. Very, very good for you. No, it's good. Uh, so I'll have to wait and see what your take on it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you, I, I'm almost done interviewing you. Um, <laughs> are you drawn to that? Uh, are you drawn to that idea? I certainly am. The, which idea that you'd get to, that you'd go and hang out and spend time with, yes. with uncontacted people? Well, you've done it in um, what what part of South America were you at? Were you well? Yeah, I, they're not uncontacted. Not but they're definitely not uncontacted. But uh, yeah, so, some tribes that like the Chimane and the Makushi and Wapashan. Um, are all tribes in northern South America who have long, long history of of contact and engagement with the outside world, but uh, individuals who can still very much like hang out with individuals who aren't that old, who in their youth were uh, very much like living a hunter gatherer lifestyle with a with a mix of native materials and also some Western materials. And this was Guyana, Guyana and Bolivia. Mm. Um, people that, you know, people that would still make their bows from native materials, people that, uh, grew up using canoes that were made like hand, you know, hand dug dugouts using, uh, plant toxins to kill fish, but also like, you know, also other 
very modern stuff. Like one of these guys that I really appreciate hanging out with. I mean, the guy's got an email address, but <laughs> I might have told you the story before. He's got an email address, but he also told us about. Um, we interviewed him on our show on our podcast, and and he's telling me about how their peccaries, their white lip peccaries, aren't around right now because there's a shaman in another village who's jealous of their village for being so prosperous and has locked their peccaries up inside of a mountain and that they're training their own shaman to free the peccaries from the mountain and you can shoot this dude an email <laughs> so right explain a peccary to people oh people here are familiar with a javelina yeah yeah a javelina is a collared peccary and then there's a and they'll run in little troops of now you might see anywhere from one to 13 or 14 white lip peccaries are a bit bigger and they'll run in groups of 200 wow yeah they'll ravage like like these uh, these people have a somewhat agrarian lifestyle they they hunt fish and also have farms scattered throughout the the jungle and they'll just come in and ravage farms in groups of you know like i said groups of 100 200 I should be honest here and say I've never laid eyes on a white lip peccary. There's a third peccary, a uh, Chacoan or Chacoan uh, peccary that is much more rare than the collared and white lipped. Yeah, picture of this, Jamie. There it is the oh, white lip. Yeah, those wow. supposed, those supposedly taste a lot better than collared peccaries. And I've hunted collared peccaries in uh, in West Texas and in Sonora, Mexico. Are they native to West Texas, or did someone bring them in? No, no, no. Collared peccaries are native. Oh, okay. Por like portions of New Mexico, Arizona, and West Texas. So they look similar to oh, That's a javelina. No. Oh, it is a javelina. A javelina and a collared peccary are the same damn thing. Oh, okay. They got, you'd, you'd appreciate this because uh, just knowing your tastes, they have a large breast with a nipple on the top of their back. Like oh. what would be the neck of your ass has a nipple. Whoa. That's their scent gland. So it's an actual nipple that someone nurses from? Nope. It's just a scent gland. Oh. I'm sure you're, you're trusty. Um, <laughs> Jamie? <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> can find a nipple on the back of a Yeah, pig. he'll find a picture. Uh, are they somehow related to pigs? No. Not people like People like to think that they are, but they're not. Wow. Oh, there it is. Yep. See that? Yeah. Javelina tits. When you clean them, you need to cut that away. Um, uh, because it really like stinks to high heaven. Is it like a tarsal gland? Like yep. the same sort of it's a scent gland. Very powerful smell, and you usually smell them well ahead of seeing them. And they're really um they're they're pugnacious. You know, you can call at them with a and mimic the sound of a distressed young one, and they come in ready to kick your ass. I saw that on your show yeah. when you and Remy went bow hunting yep. them. They run at you. Remy's got a lot of experience messing around with these things. Um, it, it's funny because they're pretty popular. Like, you know, they're good to eat, but they're they're much more popular south of the border in Mexico. It's much more common to eat javelina. They make sausage out of them and stuff. Yeah, something? yeah, they grind them up, make sausage. <laughs> I'm cook just various things like you know. I don't know anybody. Maybe someone's out there that, that like actually takes like a back strap off of a javelina and throws it on the grill. But you generally do like preparations with them where you where you cook them a fair bit. Yeah, you'd have to break down. They got to be tough, right? Not they are. Fat. You couldn't just grill one. You yeah. couldn't just grill one. They're lean. You got to cook them down. But you can see how uh, you can see why they'd be popular though. Because I mean, it's a pretty like it's a nice little bundle like of meat, right? And and I think that in some areas, like especially you know in Sonora and elsewhere, um, people aren't likely to like turn their nose up at good protein sources. Mm. Yeah. It's one thing that's like it's one thing that's like made for bow hunting because I think that uh, with rifle hunting and people do hunt with rifles and I've shot them with rifles, but it's a it's it's a little bit it can be kind of feel like a little bit of a gimme mm. because they're not you have to get very close to them before they're concerned about your presence mm. they're tough they got toss you know they can, they can kill stuff and rip stuff and they have like a they're almost you know you think of the most like i would imagine of all the creatures like a snapping turtle is least concerned with things that like a snapping turtle doesn't care about anything until it's within six inches of its face and Havelina's kind of, it's not that exaggerated, but kind of have this like, 
their world sort of seems to end at 60 yards, but they don't care what's going on outside of that buffer. And so... Um, so you can kind of creep up to them. Kind of walk up to them <laughs> when you see them. <laughs> Do they see bad? Are they like pigs? They, have they poor seem eyesight? to have very poor eyesight. They seem to have poor eyesight and have an, an amazingly varied diet. Um, you know, they'll eat like... I mean, if you lay there long enough, they would come up and eat you. Yeah, they ate my friend's dog. Oh. Yeah. Huh. Well, my friend's friend, Doug Stanhope, my buddy, he lives in... Uh, he lives in Arizona. Was he and, pretty tore up about it? Yeah. Well, they were, you know, they they hate those fucking things. They 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 just uh, piled on this dog and ate the neighbor's dog. And apparently it's not too uncommon. Yeah. It happens. Flesh eaters. Yeah, they'll they'll fuck up a dog. They're weird. I you know, it's like one of the things that I think it points to a certain amount of uh sociopathy that I have. But when I hear about someone losing a cat or dog to wild creatures i don't like my initial instinct isn't to be sad mm. i see what you're saying you're like wow that's part of the because you kind of, of view you sort of i have this view that yeah i have this view of that 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 sort of like settlement and development v wildlife mm-hmm is is a global problem right and one always wins like the destruction of wildlife habitat always wins and then when you see it, it when you see it play out like that in some ways you kind of like hope like ryan callahan who you know yep recently uh you know that kid got a, a, a young kid it's like a nine or ten year old girl got thrown up in the air by a bison yeah did you see that yeah in yellowstone yeah and by no means does cal hope to see someone uh, you know, especially particularly a child get hurt, but he's like, you know, they still got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't just close in on a bison. They apparently yeah. got within fifteen yards of that thing, which yeah. is just ridiculous. Yeah, I think I keep thinking about making a shirt that says um, Yellowstone National Park uh, habituating wildlife since eighteen seventy seven. They do. It is weird. Uh, I've only been once. Well, I, I went once when I was a kid, but I went once recently with my family, and it was uh, very weird that you could take selfies with elk. Yeah. These big herds of elk are so confident that people won't shoot them when they're in, like, the public tourism area that they just go and hang out near the vending machine. Yeah. So I'm getting a Diet Coke, and there's an elk, like, 30 <laughs> yards away from me. It's so strange. That's that's a little bit in line with what that's a little bit in line with what I'm talking about when I talk about like that when I hear someone's dog got killed by a coyote. Yeah. Oh, you know, and again, man, I know like like my brother has this little dog that he just loves and they're inseparable. Um if that dog got carried off by a great horned owl and a healthy great horned owl could carry this dog off. It's like a little shitting dog. I would feel real bad for him. Uh so with that said, I, I do have this thing where you kind of root and I do feel sad when I see like in a place like Yellowstone, this is where it gets a little bit weird. When I see an, wild animals, especially animals that people hunt for, when I see that they've lost their fear of humans, some people would look and be like, oh, this is like what naturally they should be like. Okay. So this is animals where they've had to give up their human that where they've lost their human fear because we've given them this wild place i see old timey old dude, timey steve sorry, ranella it's <laughs> a good dude joe farinato call him he's a good guy uh people see in, in like a Yellowstone Park atmosphere, you see where wildlife becomes habituated to humans. And they feel like they're seeing something more natural, right? Because outside of human hunting, they all of a sudden don't have that feeling anymore. I look at that and I see that it's like, um, to me, it feels like something's been subverted and something's wrong with that situation. Yeah. Because it sort of depends on how fresh your perspective is. Because, I mean, people have been hunting, uh, you know, people have been hunting in that area, I mean, at least 10,000 years. So then we take like a hundred year break and the animals become very accustomed to people. It's, it's shocking how quickly they can get it back. And, and oftentimes those same elk that live like the same elk that will spend their summer in that park will migrate out of there and go into national forest and on ranch land. And where, then they'll be where they people? can be hunted and they know 
They wow. crossed that line. So the same elk that some dude could basically walk up and touch there will just something in his head switches and he enters and they enter into a new mind space when they leave and they're still exposed to human predation. And if they wind you, they'll bolt. Oh yeah. It, it's, it's, it's shocking how <laughs> it's shocking the degree to which they, the degree to which they can keep this together in their heads. And it's also pretty surprising how, how quickly they adapt. Like I would imagine if you were to open up this would be a pretty controversial idea, but I'll throw it out there. Let's say you were to open up hunting in Yellowstone National Park. I think that it would probably be less than a year. I think like a season, a fall hunting season, would have them right back into the same mindset that all the other animals that that live with human predation, their sort of attitude toward people. I think Mm. they would very quickly get it back. It makes sense. But yeah, people going up and petting stuff. Um Again, like referring to Cal, his idea is that like people have gotten to where they confuse national parks with amusement parks and they feel that the animals are like on rails, <laughs> you know, they're they on tracks. Yeah. The they just, and it's like they're programmed to do a certain thing, but well, it's still wild. It's one thing that I've discovered over the last seven years, thanks to you and thanks to you getting me hunting, is that most people have no idea what it's like to be around actual wildlife, to sneak up to them. Most people have no idea about their sense of smell, like to see an animal wind you and then just fucking bounce, to to see that and to know that like you're dealing with some superhuman ability, some uh, like impossible to imagine with the confines of your own biology, what these animals can do. And when when you're out amongst them and there's no cell phone service and there's, it's just, footprints and trekking your way through mountains it's amazing i mean it's it's not yellowstone what yellowstone is and what anything like that and zoos is the worst example right but when we think of animals like people always tell me like like because you know i have a famous dog i run with him all the time and he's on my instagram (laughs) it's like Everybody loves him. He's the sweetest dog <laughs> in the world. And they, they're like, I know that dog. If you love dogs, how could you? How could you hunt animals? And I'm like, well, that's no. that's not. He's not an animal. He's a dog. He's a pet. He's uh, is a science project. An, an animal is a wolf. An animal is a deer. That's an animal. What a dog is. They don't survive outside of us. If you don't take care of them, they won't know what to do. They'll hope that the dog catcher comes and gets them and somebody rescues them. They're not wild animals. It's not. And it, has, it almost has less to do with how they're raised and more to do with their ancestors. Like their, their biology has changed. They've literally been bred to something different. They're a fucking science project. Yeah. And you see my dog. He's got floppy ears. He's a sweetheart. Everybody who meets him, he drops to his back. He wants you to rub his belly. He's just the sweetest dog in the world. That is not a dog. I mean, it's not an animal. There's not an animal like that that would ever exist out in the wild. Because if he sees another dog, he's like, hello, are you my friend? He's not like checking to see if that thing's going to steal his food or, or rob him of his mates or, or, or kill his babies. Yeah, he's a, it's, it's the result of a 20,000 or whatever your yeah. experimentation with the domestication of an animal. Yeah. So most people, when they say they love animals, they don't even fucking know any. They don't even know what they are. They see the caged animals at the zoo. They see the animals on a rope that they, they take to the dog park. They think they know what an animal is. They don't even have any experience with it. We've been so domesticated and so isolated in cities. Most people, especially most people that have opinions on this shit, you know, people that live in rural areas, I mean, you know that. You live in Bozeman, and Bozeman is, you know, surrounded by these areas that are just fucking completely wild. I mean, if you're in Bozeman, you can drive an hour from your house, and then you're around bears and deer yeah, yeah, yeah. and eagles. I mean, it's a completely wild place. But people that are in those areas, people around Boise, Idaho, for example, they have a totally different idea. People in Wyoming, they have a totally different idea of what wildlife is versus somebody who lives in Santa Monica. Like there's a video that just somebody sent me today <clears throat> of um, a guy in Thousand Oaks uh, is uh, on his street and he's filming a fucking enormous mountain lion. I mean, it is huge. It's a big boy. It's like 150 pounds. 
and uh, they're in the car and they're looking at it through the window and him and his son it seems like are, are filming this thing going holy shit look at this thing yeah, yeah. it's right there on the street a big ass cat and he was saying that like somebody was film somebody was feeding it apparently and they're they're trying to figure out what you want me to send it to you um, I'll send it to you yes, but this uh you know that's that's super rare. I mean, that's a real wild animal. It's super, super rare that, that anybody would have any kind of experience with one of these things. And most people that are talking about animals, they just really don't know what that even means. They're just saying it. Yeah, I think that there, there's developed a <clears throat> like a, a pretty big cultural division between people who um, – a pretty big cultural division between people who kind of like live around and work around and deal with animals and people who – view them or think of them as very other uh, a friend of mine who's a biologist this, this, oh there you go yeah no no i'm sending you another one i sent it to you it's it's uh from thousand oaks i just sent it to you <clears throat> that's a friend of one, mine though that's a that's a recent one too a uh, buddy of mine who's a biologist with the forest service a guy named carl malcolm he might have heard on our our show uh he just sent me a, a paper that was about kids attitudes to wildlife and it was comparing rural people's attitude and knowledge of wildlife kids with urban and, and suburban attitudes about wildlife and you, you can see the input of media when you look at this thing because people who live in an urban or suburban environment when they tell you the top of mind wildlife that they know about it's non-native stuff like lions? Yeah, they're likely to know, like, what's what's an animal, right? And an animal would be like, oh, it'd be like a giraffe, right? Mm. And, and and people who have a more um, rural or remote viewpoint would be are, are much more likely to, like, when they think of wildlife, to think of things that they interact with, mm. you know, and not like the things that are on your mobile above your crib <laughs> when you're a little baby. Right. And it sort of points – and, and also – there, there's a slight tendency, I got to look at this more carefully, but there's a slight tendency to have uh, negative feelings or think things are dangerous or bad the more urban you are in terms of native wildlife, to more recognize it as like a negative or bad thing. And what they're pointing to is, um, again, I want to look at this much more carefully and pardon me to the authors, of, authors if I'm messing this up, I was just looking at it this morning. Um, what they're pointing to is the 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 stirrings of there being a, a greater acceptance of decreased biodiversity hmm. meaning that you're kind of like okay with the bad things having gone and we're focused on like what are animals well animals would be like a giraffe and hippopotamus and the things that that disney tells me about and not like possums and raccoons which are kind of gross hmm. you know you get that video yeah, yeah. look at this fat boy <clears throat> Play this thing. It's collar, didn't it? Yeah, it's got a collar on it. Oh, it's interesting. I could see that better. There's a lot of them out here that have collars. We got a photo that we just had uh, commissioned, and uh, it should get here soon, right? Yeah. yeah. It's huge, of uh, the the big cat that they photographed near the Hollywood sign. Yeah. It looks like it's staged. I mean, the cat is walking right by the trail camera and the Hollywood. Oh, it's that dude that sets background. up those famous. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. in National Geographic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. good picture. Yeah, we got one uh, printed on that, that picture right there. I mean, come on, man. That's yeah. crazy. That is a goddamn crazy picture. It's a giant cat. Like, look at the forearms on that motherfucker. Well, it's got Ooh. that saggy stomach. But it bums me out looking at that collar. There was a conversation that you had on your podcast <laughs> about uh, shooting a deer. favorite subject, yeah. <laughs> about shooting a deer that's wearing a collar, and I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. I don't want to shoot a deer that's wearing a collar. I don't care if it's wild as fuck. If they caught it when it was a baby and they just weighed it and measured it and then let it go and it didn't have a collar and uh, I saw that deer, I wouldn't think twice about shooting it. But if I saw it and it was wearing a collar, I'm like, I'm out. Oh, totally. I'm but out. there's a really funny thing and you might, you probably caught wind of this uh, or, or know about this is that it's duck a big bands. deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to shoot a duck with a band on it, everybody knows it's cool as shit. Like I know that. That's Everybody weird. wants to shoot a bandit. Most people listening to this don't know that. It's cool as shit if you get a banded duck. Why is that? Well, it's a little bit social science because long ago, like, we used to not understand. This is kind of a little bit tricky to explain. We used to not understand how migrations worked because everyone only knew what they saw. 
Okay. And there wasn't someone who was sort of like coalescing all of this information. People would know very well, like, you know, wherever you, you live along the Mississippi river. Okay. Um, and you might know very well that like in November, shitloads of ducks that you haven't seen, they haven't been here all year are coming from the North and going to the South. And you knew that very well. You knew that ducks moved. You knew that they moved through here, but you didn't put all of the, you had no way to put all the pieces together. Over time, we wanted to understand like animal migrations better. And one of the early, this is way pre collars, like GPS collars and, and pit tags and shit. Uh, we started this banding system where you could go and catch a duck in, in its, we're in its nesting area. There's like times a year when it's really easy to catch ducks. One, you can catch them when they're young and you can catch them when they molt. So people would go out and put a band on a duck and you'd go, you could go up in the, in the Arctic or the upper Midwest, anywhere and throw a band on a baby duck. And that band would have a phone number on it. And you were encouraged to, when you got a banded duck, it was like they made it be that it was a good thing. And you were encouraged to call that 1-800 number or whatever the hell they were before 1-800 numbers and give them the, 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 the band, the band number. And then we started to really with like great detail map out flyways, how ducks migrated. Like the, the ducks in uh, on the Arctic slope in Alaska tend to follow along this path and they tend to end up here at this date. And they're, they're down in, you know, whatever, they're down in Texas all of a sudden or they're down in Southern California and they're, they're, they're hanging out in rice fields around Sacramento, whatever the hell it is. We started to put together this whole detailed picture. And it was one of the great achievements in wildlife biology was what we er learned from the duck banding system. So I think that over time it became, like I said, it was sort of like social engineering where people were taught to think it was cool. And you would wear a, a band. You would, if you had a lanyard where you keep, you keep your duck calls on, this still goes on. If you got a lanyard, you have your duck calls on. Any banded bird you get, you put that band on your lanyard. I even met these knuckleheads from North Dakota who have a lot of bands on their lanyards from banded birds they've shot. And you'd be like, dude, that's a lot of bands. And he goes, yeah, not one of them's reported. Hmm. They think that it, that it remains more pure to – dude, I – I don't know. That's the dumbest shit I've ever it's heard. It's the dumbest shit. I wish you guys did like call. Why wouldn't anybody want to contribute to all I, this? I, I don't know. You'd have to have like a calling component to your show and we would call one of these dudes <laughs> and have them explain in greater detail. But I remember thinking like that's the most the, that's the most fucked up thing I've ever heard. But I yeah. I don't think you'd want to talk to that guy. It there. was like, he's like, yeah, they're all unreported. Anyways, I don't know if it's like an anti-science thing. Well, you love to argue. Did you talk to that guy about this? You know, it was long ago. I could take where I was standing. I was in my brother's kitchen in Miles City, Montana. Um, beneath this crazy chandelier he bought online and I remember everything about it but I don't remember when I if I challenged him on the sense of of being proud of having not contributed to our scientific understanding of waterfowl migrations and why maybe like, like a sort of anti-government sentiment uh, like some black helicopter stuff okay regardless yeah some militia shit it's cool to have bands and I have like in my sort of I have like a box where I put important stuff to me but imagine if you had a box of deer collars. Dude, there's no way. If I, <laughs> I wouldn't put a deer collar. That's what I'm getting at. It's like, those are cool, but collars are not. And we had a friend. There's a, there's a friend of mine who's a, she's a, does a lot of carnivore research and other research projects named Carmen uh, Van Bianchi, which is a cool name. But she says that, you know, I'm someone that collars animals. And I even think that she's like, when you get one with a collar on it, she said, it was, quote, we talked about this the other day. Was, she's like, someone has already got the best of them, that they become tainted when they've been held by someone else. And Damn. that's a little bit how I view it, where like a wild animal, you want to imagine it being like the wildest wild animal. And yeah. once it has a collar, it's like someone, it's, it's all sloppy seconds, man. Yeah. Well, isn't that why the allure of Alaska is so interesting? Because it's one of the rare places where, like, if you run into a caribou in Alaska, there's a high probability that Never that encountered a person. Never. It doesn't even know what you are. Like, you've seen videos of hunters walking towards caribou with, like, their bow on their head. Yep. And the caribou's like, what in the fuck is this? They yeah. don't even know. They think that bow is a rack. Their assumption in areas where I've been... Um, 
particularly like like up on the Arctic Slope. Uh, no, that's not true because I've seen it a lot of, in, uh, in the mountain ranges too in South Central Alaska. When they see your movement, their assumption is that you're a caribou. That's like it seems. I, I can't. You, you can't get in their head. But their assumption is that like, oh, I better go check it out, and then I'll circle downwind to make sure it's not a, uh, make sure it's not a grizzly or a wolf or whatever. But they're like, you know, a, 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 a something that weighs a few hundred pounds, a couple hundred pounds whatever walking around probably a caribou and they just like come on over they come to you until they can rule it out but they're gregarious and they want to find each other oh. and it, it 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 that sort of thing like winds up and giving you a little bit of a sense of uh it makes you feel a little bit bad for them right they're they're, they're not tuned in like a mule deer is yeah and, and then you realize it's just like living like that I mean, these things are these are things that could migrate. You know, they migrate hundreds hundreds of miles. Have you hunted an axis deer yet? Yeah, axis deer in Hawaii is the, the most perverse, strange, but necessary hunting that I've ever experienced. Yeah, and you know what? And they don't have nat- like on Hawaii. They're not dealing with natural predators. Zero. It's just all. People. It's all. They're just like they're just very in tune to the, like yeah. their predator being people. Yeah, I imagine that they probably. Um, Car- the same way that we carry with us a, a sort of natural abhorrence of snakes, you know, a natural abhorrence of spiders, I would imagine that they come from a – that you probably know a little bit better me because you spent more time with axes deer. They probably come from a very predator-rich environment, I'm guessing. Oh, originally. Yeah. And, and so, like, India. And, and carry with them a real high, strong sense from having dealt with like very efficient predators. Tigers. Yeah. Yeah, they evolved to get get away from tigers. Like they, they got to be high, strong. They are the fastest things I've ever seen in my life. I have videos of one where I shot at this one from 55 yards, 15 yards away. He sees the arrow coming 15 yards away from him, and he's like, zoop. Ducks it. He's out of there. It's crazy. It's like they kind of understand that things coming towards them kill them yeah. because they are hunted 365 days a year because they have to. They're so overrun. There's some somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty to 30,000 deer on this one island with 3,000 people. And you, you've never seen herds like this before. It's crazy. I want to bring you. It was that when I, I hunted them years ago, um, and I remember the, the area I had been had been hunted very, very heavily uh, – do they call them? They call them does or hinds. Hinds. It had been hunted very stags, heavily. Stags and hinds. And my God, was the it, from my from my li- very limited perspective, from uh, just a small set of experiences that happened over a couple of days, it seemed like um, the the pressure on the males had been extraordinary. Where it seemed like you would see a hundred hinds per stag. I don't know if that's common there or not. No, it's not. It's almost. I remember 50, being like 50. very surprised by that. It's almost fifty-fifty when you go to these areas uh, that are, you know, in Lanai, and apparently the same thing with Maui. They're everywhere. There's so many of them. Maui has a real uh, eradication uh, sort of uh, program underway, which is controversial, right? Very controversial. But they're also selling it. There's uh, they're selling uh, venison sticks and venison jerky, and there there's companies that are establishing these they're they're establishing these uh, conservation efforts where they're going out and they're shooting x amount per year, like six thousand per year, which is like doesn't even put a dent on. Yeah, them. is the goal eradication or is the goal no. just to limit limit them? But they eradicated them from the Big Island. Somebody had put them on the Big Island. Somebody had taken them from one of the other islands and put them on the Big Island, and they had spent millions of dollars to eradicate them. Forgive me, if, stop me if we spoke about this before, but there's uh, kind of an interesting perspective that someone gave to me about Hawaii, where we, we have this, li- you know, Hawaii is just dominated by non-natives, okay? Um, I might be wrong about some of these, but I don't think I am. Breadfruit, coconut, um, all these, like uh, all the major fruiting trees are non-native, and so much of the wildlife is not native. I mean, they have like like surprising shit. They have wild turkeys. There's wild cattle, pigs, axis deer. I think there's like black buck antelope running around. Wild horses, chuckers, pheasants. Just they hunt horses. Yeah, yeah. I, I was talking to a guy one time that snares cattle. Wow. I don't know if he does it illegally or not, but he, he snares cattle. My mom's uh, um, 
I guess I would call it, you know, technically he'd be my stepfather, but it feels funny. My mom, my, my stepfather, my mom's husband, who, who she married after my dad passed away, he grew up snaring white-tailed deer with garage door cable. But they, they were like, they were farmers and they just ate. And that was sort of his relationship with deer, setting snare, setting garage cable snares. Wow. Yeah. And just using that as a source of food. They were just hungry, you know, wow. poor. Um, but uh, anyways, in Hawaii, right, those, were colon- those islands were colonized by humans like 1,100 years ago. And those, and so now we have like native Hawaiians or Hawaiians, right? Um, and I've spoke with, with some native Hawaiians who feel that there's this uneasy relationship between w- what we're regarding and describing as non-native wildlife, even down to pigs, even though that their ancestors, you know, 1100 years ago brought the pig to the island. And someone expressed me very simply, he's like, how can I be? Hawaiian, like I'm native Hawaiian. I damn sure am Hawaiian. Why is the thing that I hunt regarded as a non-native and needs to be eradicated? He's like, if we really want to talk about non-natives, I feel like that would be you. Right. Yeah. And he was like, and he was kind of pissed about this, this attitude towards, because these are guys that like to hunt and eat a lot of wild game, about this attitude to axis deer and this attitude to pigs. And you hear the same thing out of Australia. You hear the same thing out of New Zealand, which is guys who have this this difficult relationship with uh, the things that they've come to hunt and the things that have sort of been culturally accepted, culturally accepted as as wildlife, right? Um, where people, you know, I don't, I don't want to use I don't want to use environmentalists here in a way that makes it be that the that the hunters aren't necessarily environmentalists, but in ways where some people with what they would describe as an environmental agenda want to see species eradicated, the people have been interacting with for a hundred years, in some cases, like like in Hawaii, in some cases perhaps a thousand years, they've been interacting with it on the landscape. But then someone wants to come and say, we want to get rid of it because it's not native. And it causes like a, a ton of tension mm. where it creates a, a weird situation for people in, in, in some of these places is that hunters have long justified their actions to the public as being that we're controlling, right? We're like controlling non-natives. So we're doing a good thing. But then someone says like, oh, you know, I got that better idea. Let's just kill all of them. And then the hunter's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> We know they did that off. Of I don't the, mean like that. There's an island off the California coast that was filled with elk and deer. Oh, what was it called? I don't forget. See if you can find it. it an, they eradicated all of them. They they just machine gunned them. Yeah. Just helicopters and just eradicated all of them. Are you familiar with the practice in those cases where they could have a Judas animal? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's good shit. There's a great uh, article about or a podcast about that from uh, Radio Lab mm. where they kept uh, sending this uh, Judas goat to like, the Galapagos. And uh, he'd find the other goats and like da, 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 da. they'd gun them all down. This Judas goat be like, "Where are my friends? Fuck!" And just keep keep wandering off. And you know he's sterile, so he can't breathe. Oh, is that right? And he'd go to find these other goats, and they'd follow the collar, the GPS on the collar, and find the new group of goats, and they'd gun them down too. That would begin to wear on a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think goats entirely know what's going on. The other day we had a meeting with our kids. Okay. We had a meeting with our kids. Oh, Santa Rosa Island. Yeah. So Santa Rosa Island. Oh, dude, it, I was just I was there not long ago. It used to be filled with elk and deer, and people had sort of set it up. Santa Rosa Island elk. They had set it up. Pro hunters hit Santa Rosa Island. I think they mean professional. In that case, I would have used professional, elk. not pro. Murderers, deer murderers. And this is in 2011. So it was a Mule fairly. Deer. Fairly recent thing where they eradicated all these animals. Yeah, I was just I just not long ago fished off there. It's supposed to be amazing fishing. The Catalina apparently is like the greatest mako shark fishing in the world. Which is a, here here's a weird one. Shark fishing, all of a sudden you're an asshole. It used to be with Jaws, like you caught a shark. Hey, good, get that fucking thing out of here. They're gonna kill people. Yeah. Now it's like you monster sharks fin soup. Don't yeah. you care about the? Don't you know this global warming? Like everything gets conflated. It's all like piled on together. Like you, what are you doing with a shark? You used to be able to buy mako shark in a restaurant. Oh, you still see it, but yeah. there, there is a, there is. I saw a thresher shark the other day on a menu. I did a story. I did a magazine story about this long, long ago. It was like it was right when I got out of school, and I, it was the like first like assignment I had to go write an article. 
and I was writing it for Outside Magazine. And um, this is 19 years ago, man. And there's a thing called Mako Madness. And it was this thing in Montauk. Uh, you know what's funny about doing this? This is in 2000. And I got sent out there and had never, ever been to New York. And I didn't even go into the city. I just flew into wherever the hell I flew into and got a car and stupidly took a cab to – I didn't understand the – I was just very young. I didn't understand. Like I took a cab from like the airport out to Montauk. Oh, my God. Yeah. How much did that cost? I don't even remember. But I remember like when I had to turn in my expenses, people were like, oh, what? And I'm like, I just, I didn't, remember, like, I didn't know. But anyways, it was funny because uh, I remember driving along and seeing the, it was like the summer before and seeing the twin, it was like a year before and seeing the twin towers, you know? Oh, yeah. And it was like my first ever view and I never saw that place again. I never saw it again until after. But there's this thing called uh, Mako Madness and it was like a shark tournament. And traditionally it had been like a contest to get the biggest shark. And they would bet money on it. And there was like the general registration fee. So all these captains who had charter boats would join Mako Madness and they would book clients on their boats for Mako Madness. And when you had to, you had to pay some amount of money to, this probably still goes on. You had to pay some amount of money to register your boat to be in the contest. But the real money was in all these side bets called Calcutta's. And so you could, there was enough side betting going on around all the various captains that the biggest Mako could win hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand dollars Whoa. to catch the biggest Mako. But the sort of the fatal flaw in this tournament, from a public perception standpoint, would be that there was a category for just biggest shark, and there's a category for like biggest Mako. So people going out like at a time, this is when at this is when shark populations were still. You know, and, and globally, they're still on a decline, but there was still a lot of shark bycatch from swordfish, long lining and other things. And there was people were getting very worried about shark stocks and shark numbers. Um, and at one time, Mako Madness, there's a lot more Makos, like people would be registered Makos. But there had been some years where Mako Madness had no Makos. People weren't bringing in a Mako. So everyone would go out and just they make damn sure that like, I don't want to come back empty. So they would catch a blue shark. Because if no one caught a Mako, you still might get biggest shark from catching a blue shark. And at the end of this thing, man, they had dumpsters. They would not dumpsters. They had they would fill a dumpster with blue sharks, and no one would eat it, dude. It would no. It would go into a dumpster. But you can eat blue shark. Yeah. Well, you can. They're high in urea, and just you know, oh. it's like everything else. Like yes, you can. So Mako is the most edible. Mako Thresher. Um, can you eat a great white? You know what's funny about great whites is there's a guy, there's a writer I love, and he does all these fisheries guidebooks named Vic Dunaway. I don't know if he's dead or alive, but I got all of his books. He's got like Gulf Coast, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Coast. Um, he does these books like, it's like all the fish that you're likely to catch, kind of like how to catch them. And then he, he, what I like about it, he's got like a qual- food quality section. And his food quality sections are really funny. And like the the highest praise is he can give some like excellent or one of the best, right? So if you look up Snook, it'll be like one of the best. Um, his his headline for great uh, I looked in Great White Shark. It says don't even ask. <laughs> but people feel that they'd be good because salmon shark are good. They used to call them poor beagles. Like salmon shark have a very good reputation, and makos have a good reputation, and threshers have market value. And there's other sharks in other areas that have market value, but those ones are like are, are ones that are popular table fare. Um, the assumption is that white, that great white sharks would probably be good. There must be somebody who's eating one. Oh, I'm sure there's plenty of people that have eaten them. But at this Mako Madness thing, I can't remember the point I was getting at. What the hell was I driving at by talking about Mako Madness? Oh, in this article, I got into like the history of where like shark hunting and killing sharks came from. Is You're familiar with Jaws, right? Mm-hmm. Well, sort of the shark fisherman character in Jaws is based on this like very real dude, Frank Mundus. And Frank Mundus used to fish out of Montauk. And at a time, Montauk was this premier destination for people catching swordfish and big bluefin tuna. And as those big pelagic fisheries had collapsed from overfishing in the 70s, Frank Mundus, he'd go out and he'd just go out and, and find a, you know, he'd go out famously, he'd go out and find a beached whale or not a beach whale, but a floating dead whale. And he'd anchor up on that whale and catch big ass great whites. And then come in and hang the bloody carcass up on the docks. 
and he made necklaces with tooth sharks and shit and he became like the monster man or something or the monster hunter and started booking all these crazy trips where tourists would come and be like holy shit i want to go kill a big monster and he's credited with having created this like culture of like going out and getting yeah that's is that a, him that's, that's frank mondes let me see that picture upper left dude so there he is Look yeah him. he kind of like built this idea of like shark hunting and, bo- and like shark bite in his forearm go to, back to that that'd be interesting if frank mondes shark shark forearm oh. so, something took a bite out of that motherfucker Probably, yeah so he's got the necklace yeah the dead shark and Frank Mundus kind of like like spawned this sort of thing where you'd want to go out and catch a big shark and hang it up and then throw it in a dumpster. Wow. And people look at like when people look at that history, they look at it being as like it's like in some ways Mundus and shark hunting was symptomatic of declining fisheries. Look at that picture of him and the dude with from the movie. They're so similar. Look at that. The black and white and the color next to each other. Look at that. Oh, yeah. What was that guy's name? The guy in the movie? Can't remember. What was the actor's name? That guy was fucking awesome. What a great scene. You know Mo Fallon? Yeah. That's still his favorite movie, I think. It's a great movie. <laughs> Dude, he loves Jaws. It's a great movie. <laughs> it's interesting that the narrative... He could, he could conv- next time you see him, have him convince you that Jaws is the greatest movie ever. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's a great movie. Richard Dreyfuss? I mean, come on. Um the narrative of uh, sharks fin soup and sharks being you know something that we need to protect that sort of it's a new thing it's only, yeah. it only existed over the last decade or so i think so yeah it used to be if you caught a shark like good for you you you're keeping it from killing someone who's swimming or someone who's surfing the the the, the idea of sharks fin soup and and its lure was driven home to me one time when we were in berkeley and we were at a boat launch we'd come off fishing and we'd been out fishing for leopard sharks um, remember uh, the Life Aquatic? Mm-hmm. That's a good movie. Yeah. Do, you, do you like his stuff or no? Bill Murray, love him. No, I mean like the director Anderson, Wes Anderson. Oh, what has he done besides that? Fucking uh, World Tenenbaums. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I think his masterpiece is the Life Aquatic. But yeah. uh, in there they got you know the the famous shark, and there's the jaguar shark, which is a good idea for a shark. I don't think it exists, but there are leopard sharks. And we were fishing for leopard sharks, and we came back to the boat launch, and there's a dumpster there. And everybody cleans their fish and throws the fish guts in the dumpster. And I remember there was a gentleman digging through the dumpster, getting out leopard shark fins and, and heads and stuff. And I took pity on him. I thought that he was out, acting out of some sort of desperation. And I said, uh, hey, man, do you want like a nice filet? I'd be happy to give you a filet. He's like, no. <laughs> he just wanted just the fins just to make soup yeah yeah have you ever had it no i've had it shark fin soup yeah did you enjoy it it was weird it was weird it was like it's okay it's okay it's definitely not worth eradicating a fucking entire species for no it's a little disgusting uh it's a little disgusting and you know i'm always reluctant like uh, i'm always reluctant to yeah, I'm a little bit reluctant to sort of uh, oversimplify things around around harvest and, and animals and stuff because uh, I think people can take it too far. But if you've seen footage of people cutting fins. And dumping the sharks in the water. And kicking yeah. the sharks off the deck yeah. into the water. It's dark. And I think, it, but it speaks to something. I think that seeing like live finless sharks going into the water speaks to something about just your level of care. Do you know what I mean? Like whether you view something as, as sacred yeah. or not, it's hard to see that the individual engaging in that is viewing it as, uh, as sacred. And there's yeah. like, all, you know, there's a lot of stories about even like swordfish captains, uh, you know, burning blue sharks and stuff and effigy. Cause they lose so much of their swordfish catch the blue sharks, but to see people kicking them off, it speaks to something about animal suffering. It speaks to something about like, what is that person's view of the resource? Like, yeah. to what? How do they respect it? But it also just speaks to like a general thing where you you don't like to see things wasted. Yeah, and I, and my my understanding about like one of the things that slowed in U.S. waters, one of the things that slowed finning was just you used to be able to go out and you could fill your hold full of just shark parts. If you were a, a fishing captain, you could just be like, oh, "I'm just going to keep the fins." And eventually, they made it. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong here. 
I don't think I am. They eventually made it that whatever you have for shark materials in your boat on a commercial operation, only a certain percentage can be comprised of fins. And since when you're on a commercial vessel, your hold, like your, your, the area where you keep iced fish is finite, it's limited, um, it wound up being not worth it. Because let's say only like 30% of your shark parts could be shark fins and you had to keep the rest. It wasn't worth it to fill your hold full of like shark meat. And so it sort of de-incentivized people to go out and fin in U.S. waters. Mm, that makes sense. I had it a long time ago. I had it back in probably the 90s at a Chinese restaurant. In the U.S. or overseas? In the U.S. Pretty sure. Pretty sure it was U.S. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever traveled overseas in the 1990s. I barely remember it. How old were you when you first went overseas? <sighs> overseas. Sound like yeah, <laughs> like old sailors. I'm trying to. Rem- I think I was in my 30s. So Canada doesn't count as overseas. No, you can walk there. Nor because of like the dairy and you know gap in, in Central America. Like when you go to Argentina, is it overseas? It can be, <laughs> depending on if you come from Florida, right? <laughs> it depends on how you go. You can go if the they flew way. dead nuts over Central yeah. America, did you go overseas? It seems like it's kind of overseas. Yeah, it seems like a bad term. But you didn't you, you didn't have occasion to travel a lot no. when you were young. Well, I traveled a lot from fighting yeah. all around the country when I was young, and then I traveled a lot for comedy inside the country, the same thing. So there was a lot of traveling. But like traveling to another country was like, ugh, what am I doing? going over there for oh really yeah it's just more more travel yeah you know that's the it took me a while to get used to the idea of traveling for a vacation like but when you know the idea of vacations like going on vacation somewhere in europe like get the fuck out of here i'm not traveling for fun i don't like traveling i want to sit sit still yeah i got you whenever i get a vacation i just want to stay put and then I realized, ah, you just swallow it, just deal with the flight, and then next thing you know, you're in this really cool place. It took a while for me to sort of adjust my 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 view on that. Yeah, like you have a hard time taking leisure. I used to. I used to have a hard time taking leisure. Now um, I look at it like like sleep. Like you need sleep, and I think you need leisure. And I think particularly for a creative person, for a person who writes and comes up with things, you need downtime. I, got, I just had a buddy of mine, we were having this conversation about that, where he was saying that um, he feels like he's just working too much, he's doing too much comedy, he's not taking in enough. Just putting too much out, not taking in enough. Yeah, man. That's a pretty good point. Yeah. You have to, it's almost like you have to think of it as a diet. Like, what is your mental diet? You know, your physical diet is obviously very important if you're an athlete, but if you're a creative person, you have to have an awareness of your mental diet. If you're just taking in sugar all the time, just nonsense and junk food and bullshit, like your your brain is filled with uninteresting, uninspiring thoughts and, you know, the same sort of typical narrative over and over and over again. Whereas if you can figure out a way to go to Thailand or something like that, you go, whoa, these people are living a totally different life. This is a totally different way to live. And it just, you just, even if it's ever so slightly, it broadens your perspective. I can only really relax when there's nothing I could possibly be doing mm. and my kids aren't fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I was laying, I had to do this insurance policy thing. I've told this story a thousand times, but I haven't told you. I had to do this insurance policy thing and, and, uh, I like lay on my couch. This, this dude, this dude comes over my house to take my heart rate and do a bunch of, I don't know, health tests. Anyways, I'm laying on my couch and he's got this monitor hooked up to me. He's got to do it for a long time. I can't remember how many minutes, but it's like a long, it's not like going to the doctor for a checkup where they just like take your pulse from it. Like he's really like checking your shit out. And I can hear my kids now and then like a little fight flare up upstairs. Mm. And I asked the dude, I'm like, can you see that? He goes, oh, I can see that. <laughs> me hearing it. Me hearing that, like, no! Right. Or Matthew! Right? Start, That's like, mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like your heart. But mm. my, my br- older brother, Matt, who's who's a very thoughtful, um, somewhat eccentric person, he's he's now says that he needs he's going to sleep nine hours a night, which seems like an extravagance. But he's like done the math on it. And he says, if you're going to measure me in terms of productivity, I'll actually do more on nine than, let's say, six 
and you give me all those extra hours, but those extra hours aren't as productive anyways. I had a podcast with a guy named Dr. Matthew Walker, who's a sleep expert, He's written books on sleeping, and he talks about the uh, vast amount of Americans that are underrested, and and what an impact it has on your hormonal production, on your body's ability to recover, on your happiness, and your 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 body's ability to produce endorphins, and all these different variables that are extremely important to happiness and to productivity. And he's like, the vast majority of people are fucking themselves over. Vast majority. In, in great ways. It, it increases uh, your, the possibility of dementia and Alzheimer's and all these different factors. If you go, you look at guys like, uh, like Ronald Reagan, like famously slept like four hours a night. Yeah. we have got fucking Alzheimer's. Like it's, it's really common with people that have a, a very small amount of sleep and they take pride in the fact they're always pushing the needle. Those people, eventually, the, the fucking, the bearings start going. Yeah. Yeah. Do you take caution to sleep? I sleep a lot. I get good sleep. I'm very lucky. One of the things about because I exercise so much is that I'm always tired. Yeah. Like when, when I hit the hay at night and I get home from the comedy store, I fucking crash. I go down hard. I get a good solid eight hour sleep almost every night. That's good. When I when I'm in a groove of like like being careful about taking care of myself and, and uh Yeah, doing like a lot of regular exercise. How much your appetite for mm. food and your appetite for sleep? The appetite for meat. That's the big one. Increases man. greatly. Yeah. Well, my wife uh, started lifting weights, and one of the first things she said is like, God damn, I want meat like all the time. <laughs> She's doing squats and shit. She's got this uh, crazy Russian lady who's her trainer, this lady the fucking savage, and they're, they're just doing all these crazy squats and box jumps and that kind of shit. And She's just, like that Russian in yeah. the Rocky movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's that just, dude was on to like yeah. that dude was on to what's it called where the people go to like the clubhouse and roll rocks and shit oh like uh crossfit type yeah, shit? She, yeah that dude was on to crossfit oh yeah man he's his got, trainer in russia <laughs> machines in rocky that i have out there the fuck versa climber the first i found out about versa climbers watching that rocky movie when drago was on that thing i was like man he looks like he's working hard that fucking Versa Climber, a, that's a bitch, man. You ever do that thing? No, I haven't, Woo! but I'd like to. You do 30-second sprints on this, like, ah! With your legs and your arms. Yeah, you're just pedaling, and, and it's like you're climbing, and you can increase the resistance, so it's like, ah, 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 ah. for grappling, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. I can picture it. Everybody hates it, though. He, but most people, they'll, they'll they'll gravitate towards the treadmill, the elliptical machine, or other thing. They look at that thing like, no, 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 no. Yeah, because it's not fun. It's you don't get lost. Yeah, you don't get lost in it. It's horrible. It's horrible, uh, but it's amazing. When you refer to like how you fill your head up, like what you fill your head up, if it's just like junk and sugar and how much time you have to process stuff. One of the things I've noticed, and it's kind of started, it's begun to startle me a little bit, is I used to find in social situations that I would be very interested in letting people know what I thought about stuff. Mm. Even shit that I had no business talking about. <laughs> and I think that you see people, like when you see like someone who's older and we have this idea that like old, the older, wiser person and they're just taking in everything and they've learned to be quiet. Yeah. People don't really think about the fact that maybe they're just like sick of hearing themselves talk. That too. You know, the saddest thing is, though, is an old moron. <laughs> right? I, I want to say, yeah, but I mean, I think I, you need to explain like a little an, bit. an old racist. <laughs> oh. An old dummy. Yeah. An old person who has, like, ridiculous, archaic views of women or ridiculous, archaic views of society and culture and immigration and all these different things. Like a person without nuance. An old person who's not learned from the humbling experiences of life and who's has not looked at himself and his own folly and, and has a humorous <laughs> take on it. That's person, a good description. Yeah. You paint a flattering portrait. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I think about it a lot. I don't want to be that guy. You know? I, I encountered a dude like that not long ago where we, we decided that we were going to take our kids. Like, we're going to take our kids out to eat. And I don't want to have to deal with any kind of, like, added noise. And I was uh, trying to – I wanted to go – there's, like, this, like, truck that sells tacos. It's called, like, El Rodeo or something. Like, Let's go to that taco truck and eat because I don't have to talk to anybody and deal with anybody. My wife convinced me to go to uh, this brew pub. So we go down to the brew pub. I'm kind of like in a, I'm, I'm already pissed off because I'm like kind of half mad at my wife for making us be in a potentially social situation. And I'm sitting there and this old man walks past me on his way out of the restaurant and he's got a do not resuscitate bracelet. Ooh. Okay. He's like, he's got a little walk. You know those four pegged canes? Mm -hmm. 
He's got a four-pegged cane. It's probably a name for that. And a do not resuscitate bracelet. And he walks out with his wife, girlfriend, whatever. And she wanders off. And he's just standing outside the restaurant. And it's just killing me to know what that's all about. So I grab my older boy. And we walk out. And I'm like, you know, I couldn't help but notice you have a bracelet that says do not resuscitate. Uh, What's that all about? You know? And I said, do you just feel that if it's your time, it's your time and you should and you don't want modern shit to like interfere in sort of what you imagine to be like the way things go? And he explains to me is like, no, he goes, he's, he's like, he's pissed. He's already pissed. He was probably pissed before I talked to him. He's like, I don't want oxygen. I don't want CPR. I don't want nothing. And he goes, because I was having a heart attack and they resuscitated me and broke two of my ribs. Therefore, I don't want to be resuscitated. I remember thinking like, but but you were having a heart attack. <laughs> like like the trade off seems minor. Yeah, but just like he was he was so kind of just pissed that they broke his ribs that he couldn't even see. I'm like another way of looking at it would be that they saved your life. <laughs> but he's like he just wanted to suffer his heart attack. With ribs intact, and at this point, would just rather die than have broken ribs. That's the or, or something like I don't even I couldn't even begin. And all of a sudden, I thought he was interesting. And all of a sudden, I didn't think he was interesting anymore. <laughs> it's such an unfortunate perspective, <laughs> because if he said like, it's not a great story. But do you yeah. see what I'm saying? No, it is a great story because it's like if he if he said, "Hey, I had a good time." It's you know, mm-hmm. there's only enough room for so many people. That's what I thought I was gonna get. Uh, uh, you know, that's what I, I thought I was gonna looking get. Looking forward to meeting Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I was gonna get that so much so that I brought my boy with me. Oh boy! Because when I was a little kid, my dad would go out of his way to have weird people over to the house. Yeah, I, he it was important to him to expose his kids to weirdos. So I was like, "Come on, son, we'll go talk to this crazy old man." With the do not resuscitate bracelet, and you like learn something about life. That's a cr- but I'm saying like, no, nah, never mind, never mind. Forget that guy. <laughs> How hilarious is that? Like, the trade off of broken ribs for life. Broken ribs it takes like a couple of months, and you're fine. Yeah, you want to be like, dude, you're at a brew pub with your girlfriend, and yeah. she's going to get the car. You don't want to continue this. Fuck- <laughs> like, that's not bad. Not bad. That's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> you just suffer for a little bit. One of the things about growing up with martial arts is you're always injured. So you don't look at injuries the way some people look at injuries. You look at injuries like, ah, I got to go get this fixed. Mm-hmm. You got to get it fixed. I've had both my knees reconstructed. I've had a bunch of sh- my Have nose you? reconstructed. I've had a bunch of shit fixed. You just get it fixed. It's like, ah, I fucking tore this thing. I'm going to go get it fixed. I don't view it that way. Uh, Giannis had meniscus surgery. Giannis Putellis had meniscus surgery on his knee. And what's crazy, you'll, you'll have something to say about this because this is kind of in your, in your world a little bit. Uh, I developed a knee ache that I had for months. Left because knee. of him? No, I don't know. Well, because now I don't know. Pregnancy weight the, gain things? At the time, I would have told you. No, after this. At the time, I would have told you that my knee absolutely hurt. Mm-hmm. And my knee hurt. Um, and the pain drifted around. And it hurt all the time. And I was acutely aware of the pain in my knee. Mm. And I had it built up. And then I had made the mistake of having like a passing conversation with an orthopedic surgeon. It was like, oh, you know, it's probably this or that. It's you can fix it, but then it then it got worse and worse and worse. And I finally go down to a doctor to do all the scans and shit. He's like, you know, you have some arthritis. You could probably solve the problem with some physical therapy. There's like a band that runs down from your hip, and I think that's like flaring up, and that's why the pain bounces around. And dude, it wasn't too later. Two days later, that pain was gone. I said to Giannis, I'm like, man, I feel like psychologically frail. I feel that there's a very, I was like, I feel that there's a very thin membrane that separates my brain from my body. Mm. And Yana said, there is no membrane that separates your brain from your body. And I, I don't, I can't rule out now that, um, I can't rule out now that I'm like mentally pretty weak because the minute someone told me there's not actually a problem where I need to get a surgery, I like, I, I, I like, I, I now try to feel the pain, but I can't find it. <laughs> So it's, and there's no it's like, corresponding like hiking or anything that has that contributed to it where you weren't doing it once it felt better. Well, one day um, in the spring, uh, me and my buddy 
Pete Munich went out looking for blackberries during black bear season. And this was when I was really like thought I had a knee problem. And we went out and we didn't hike a long ways. We hiked maybe six miles. And um and I came back and noticed, but it was real mucky. You know when you're walking and your feet keep sticking in the muck and, it, and then your feet build up a layer of muck mm-hmm. on your boot bottom and then it comes off and then you're walking cockeyed because your other boot hasn't yeah. shed its boot mud layer? Yeah. We had one of those walks. And after that walk, the pain went away for two days. <laughs> but yeah, man, I don't know. It could it's be a like lot a of deep things. fear of being old and shit. That's real. My eyesight's going bad. Mine too. I see you wearing those little glasses. All the time. And I saw you a minute ago, you didn't have them and you couldn't barely look at your phone. No, I can read that. Like, you I had to read that. you had to like hold it unusually far away, I felt. What was I reading? Like you, that like like that I can read. I you, can read that. That's not a problem. No, you had a thing no, where you're, be honest with you. you tipped your head up and tipped your eyes down and held it far away, I felt. I do do that. <laughs> I do do that sometimes, but mostly with my phone, that's not an issue. Like, I could read emails and shit. The real, the real problem is uh, laptops, like a laptop but with small text or reading that, like that piece of paper in front of you. That's fucked. Like, if I had to read that. I mean, I could do it, but I got to do this. Talking Monkey Incorporated, the college, podcast call the joke. Yeah. Joe's reading my release. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just reality. You know, your body starts to deteriorate. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, Giannis, Giannis of, views it as like all this like journey of life shit, right? Yeah, but he's all into like weird. Giannis is into strange stuff. Like he thinks you can kind of like you you, you can kind of like uh, Conjure, manifest things. Manifest. Yeah, he just believes that. He believes. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I feel that uh, this is a this is a long debate we have about psychological states. I feel that you can have pessimistic thoughts, but as long as you behave like an optimist, you'll, you'll get the same outcome. Meaning, let's say you go hunting and you have feelings that like it's never going to work out. We're never going to get one, but you do everything right. It doesn't matter what's in your head because your actions are such. The only thing that's he doesn't like is to entertain the enjoying. negativity. He doesn't like to entertain the negativity because mm. he feels that. But I'm like, but what does it matter if we still hunt hard? What does it matter if I feel like it won't work? As long as we hunt hard, it doesn't matter. And I think that he feels he would argue that that mental state affects outcomes. And so he applies this to all the aspects of his life. Having a sense of positivity. I think there's a benefit to having a sense of positivity in the sense that you're going to enjoy the experience more. If you're always walking around pessimistic and then things happen that are good, you're like, well, look at that. All right. Well, tomorrow's (laughs) going to suck. (laughs) That was a fluke. (laughs) Whereas if you just are appreciating the fact that, hey, here I am living in America, you know, I'm healthy. I don't have cancer. Like, uh, could be so many things worse that are wrong with me. I could have been born with weird birth defects. I could have been born in, you know, El Salvador with no feet. I could have been, you know, living in some fucking drug ravaged community. I'm lucky. Just extremely, unbelievably lucky. Like, if you had given the opportunity to be Steve Rennell, if you were some guy who was living in some terrible third world country with, uh, you know, awful drug cartel violence all around you you'd be like what, what would you what would you give to be like a regular guy living in bozeman montana in a beautiful place and have a healthy happy family and a great way to make a living you're like what do i gotta do yeah what do i have you're to giving do? me you're giving me patriotic stirrings which i'm inclined to i'm inclined to it that's why i got an american flag back there but dude yeah it'd be like oh you get to have, I can have a TV show. I can start a business. Yes. Just have children. I don't think people raise them in up. this country they understand go to school. They go to lucky. like great school. Yes. For We're free. Insanely fortunate. Down the road. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of places like that anymore because people have uh, found those places and fucked them up and overpopulated them. But there's a few of them left. You just got to deal with extreme weather. The extreme weather is the barrier for pussies. It keeps them out. You think so? <laughs> yeah. No one's moving to fucking Montana. It's hard. That's why we just tried to buy Greenland. Yes, got exactly. Shot, got shot down. Well, I think I like Trump, the idea of that though. I like it too. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> you see his fucking post where he said, "I promise not to do this," and he showed a picture of Greenland with a giant Trump tower on it. I looked at it this that morning. That guy's funny. 
He might be an asshole. People might hate him. They might. He might be a problem as a president. Blah 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 blah. You can't deny that occasionally he is fucking hilarious. No, it is funny, and I think that people try. There's certain people that try hard to not see the humor in any yes. of this. I retweeted it. I was like, <laughs> "Get on with your bad self, Mr. Trump." I look, I don't read my my Twitter posts. I'm sure a bunch of people got mad at me for that, but I don't read it. I just post and forget it. I just get out of Dodge. I just leave little packages and I get the fuck out of there. I don't you know what's funny about that. that picture? That I found myself uh, zooming in trying to see what those people in those houses had going on. <laughs> I was like, oh, these guys look like they probably hunt. <laughs> well, Greenland has so much natural resources, and it's also probably a place that's going to be an awesome spot to live in 100 years when the fucking rest of the world's on fire. Maybe I'll wind up there, man. Yeah. Well, muskox. We were talking about that yesterday. Muskox. Jamie pulled up a thing, a statistic on muskox, muskox that uh, the success rate for bow hunting is 100%. <laughs> in some units. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. In Greenland. Oh, okay. 100%. In Greenland. Because, you know, they, they huddle you know they huddle up to protect themselves against wolves, so they just stay in a spot when they, they see a threat, which is great for wolves, but not so good for projectiles. Yeah, no, I've haunted them before. Yeah. Apparently, they're delicious. Brendan Burns said that they taste like the best Kobe beef. Yeah. He said it's like it's, really it, marbled. It's tough, and, but good and marbled. Yeah. You it's know what's tough. funny is the, well, I mean, tough like, Yeah. Tougher, really? but what's funny about um, w- w- I, I drew a permit like in Alaska. The way they so let me try to find another way to approach this. Any American, speaking of America, land of opportunity, any American can apply for a permit to hunt for muskox in Alaska. Um, and what units are available to you if you're not an Alaska resident vary. And, and I, I believe right now um, the only area that you can apply for a permit as a non-resident might be Nunavak Island. And I drew a permit to hunt on, to hunt muskox on Nunavak Island. I saw that episode. Yeah. And hunt, and then there the the Chupik Eskimo, and a bunch of people would be like, oh, duh, 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 duh. you can't say Eskimo, but it was funny because I asked the Chupik man who I was staying with. I'm like, you know, I feel like uh I'm always told not to use Eskimo. And he said, what the hell else would you call me? <laughs> so I'm going to say, in, 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 in deference to what this man prefers to be called, he's Chupik Eskimo. He's explaining, I'm Chupik Eskimo. I'm not something else. I think the Canadian folks Inuit. like to be b- b- referred to as Inuit or in the First high, Nation. Yeah, in the high Arctic, yeah. yeah. But in, but yeah. I think there's a lot, it's created a lot of confusion. Yeah. But um, it was just interesting that on this on this this – Western Alaska coast along the Bering Sea, he, a Chupik man was telling me that that is what he prefers to be referred to as Chupik Eskimo. Yeah. But the way that we, you know, like we, you know, people consume wild game or talk about meat, we're always like, when, when we're raiding meats, we tend to talk about tenderness or not tenderness, right? Mm. It was tough. It was tender. It was tough. It was tender. Tender being good, tough being bad. I mean, you've been involved in a hundred of these conversations. He, like, uh, this Chupik man was like, we prefer it to be tough. You know that tendon that, like, if you look at the spine of an animal, the, 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 the vertebra above its shoulder will have, like, a, what's called a thoracic, a longer thoracic process, like that blade that comes up. There's a tendon that runs from the top of those thoracic processes out to the neck, and it allows like big animals. It's really exaggerated on moose, bison, muskox, where it's like the size of your wrist, this giant tendon that's moored to the top of those thoracic processes that allows this thing like to hang its head, which, I mean, the head is 80 pounds or whatever, and it hangs off there. They like that thing. Whoa. Real chewy meat. And they even they would cook that. They would cook the muskox. They would basically like boil them. They would take the tough parts of the muskox and almost like purposefully make it more tough by wow. kind of like boil, like flash boiling it. And they would talk about like this cuts good. It's tough. <laughs> Not oh, it's so tender. Why do they like that? Did they Just explain different varied preferences? Wow, that's weird. But I, I liked it quite stuff. a bit, man. What was funny is I gave a bunch of muskox to 
a Guatemalan woman in Seattle that we knew. Uh, and I gave a bunch of muskox to her, and she made me a bunch of tamales. So I had Guatemalan-style tamales. With muskox. With muskox. And we made a deal where I gave her a bunch, and I said, you can keep half of what I give you. Like, make tamales and give me half the tamales. Oh. So we struck a deal. I had a freezer nice. full of freaking tamales, like, oh, wrapped up. Nice. But, uh, and I would laugh about that, that uh, you know, my kids would have muskox sandwiches or muskox tamales, and they'd go down to school with them. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, it was great. My kids, like, freak out other kids at school. You know, like uh, like kids at my my kids' school be like, oh, "What's your favorite food?" And my daughter be like, "I like bear." <laughs> like she, she thinks it's hilarious that she's eating bear. You know, she she likes to tell people bear sausage. It's my favorite. And the other kids are like, "What the fuck?" You know, kids that have never experienced any wild game. And my kids have eaten. You know, since 2012 when I started hunting, they've basically eaten everything. They've eaten elk. They've eaten deer, they've eaten ducks, they've eaten t- wild turkey, they've eaten everything. What's their, uh, how are they viewed in their community? Like, how are you viewed in that, that like, school parent community? <sighs> I don't know. It's hard to tell. Cause Do you go to the events? Yes. I got to go to one today. Yeah. I'm a weirdo, for sure. But are you ostracized? Friendly? No, I'm really friendly. So like most of the, it's all hugs, you know. Like the parent, like I'm a nice guy. So like when I see those folks, it's all like friendly and hugs. But some guys will pull me aside and ask me about manly activities because <laughs> they feel like, how did you? You're 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 actually allowed to be a man, and you're everyone's neutered, you know. Like so many guys are, their wives are yelling at them, and I'm off doing cage fighting events. You know, and, and uh, I took yeah, the yeah, yeah. Where, where were you last week? Oh, I was bow hunting. You know, I was in the mountains with no cell service. You know, and so like, they might be inclined to be like, "Oh, I don't like that for like Middle America rednecks," but it's okay for you. Well, they know me, right? Yeah. So they don't the the preconceived notion, and they know I'm a good dad. And they know I'm very active, and I'm constantly around my kids, and I, and I take it very seriously, and it means the world to me. So, like parents, one of the mo- the most important things that I find is good parents respect good parents. They see that you love your children. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I mean, if you find someone who's like a dismissive parent and is not interested, a disinterested parent, it's like one of the most disturbing and disappointing things. If you love someone, you care about them, and then you find out they're a bad person or a bad parent, you have to reevaluate your perspective on them. Because to me, being a parent, and my wife is huge on this it's like it's everything to her she will not talk to someone or hang out with someone if she feels like they're a bad parent and she 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 forms her relationships with her friends based on whether or not they're good parents it's it's everything yeah if you're you know you're contributing to this community so when i'm around these parents you know i'm, I'm a nice guy so it's all it's all friendly but they all have questions all these poor men that are stuck in cubicle jobs you know men men are tortured you know it's like that uh, who was it? Uh, Thoreau? Yeah. Most men live lives of quiet desperation. Yeah. yeah it's one of my favorite. Including Thoreau. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, isn't that <laughs> well, he knew what he was talking about. You know, it's, uh, it's these most people are just living this boring ass fucking life. And I'm living this life where I'm telling jokes in front of thousands of people. And then I'm doing podcasts in front of millions of people. And then I'm hunting. And then, I, and then occasionally I go off and I do cage fighting commentary. People it's like get, a caricature of masculinity, really. Yeah. People get confused. Yeah. Well, it is. And one then of, I smoke pot. So it's like, what's <laughs> going on here? <laughs> one of the things, one of the early things that surprised me about you is, Man, I don't want to use that word because I don't want it to be insulting. One of the things that uh What's more? Yeah. One of the things that surprised me about you but it sounds it sounds like assholeish is how serious you take being a parent. Because I think that someone could look. Like someone could someone could at a glance look, be like, oh, you know, uh, discussion of drugs and, and like dirty humor and sort of go like those are not congruous. With parenting, but you take super, you paint, do you take parenting like extremely seriously? Well, but you don't, I don't think you, you, you're not like, you don't, you're not so concerned with, uh, people understanding a full package that you need to spend shitloads of time telling everybody about how good of a parent you are. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. Um, I'm interested in love, you know, and, uh, 
as a kid who grew up with sort of a deficit of it, and it's very important for me to spread as much of it as I can, whether it's through my friends or through children. And to children, it's like the most important responsibility because my friends, they're fine. I met them, they're grown up, still figure it out on their own. Yeah. You know, I'll help them when I can, but, <clears throat> but kids, you know, it's like you get one shot at that. You get one shot at raising kids, man. You know, it's, it's not, you can't redo it. You can't go, oh, this one sucks. Let me rip it up and start from scratch. Like you have to do it right. And you have to, and you're going to make mistakes for sure, but you have to spend as much conscious time talking to them and interacting with them. And, you know, I like it. I enjoy it. You know? One of the things that, that, that you get afraid of about damaging your children is that you would leave a legacy of damage. Yes. Like you can have, I have all kinds of things that I did in my life and ways I treated people. And I could sit here and name names, right? Like things I did to people that were very unfortunate. I wish I hadn't done it. Someday maybe I'll call them and apologize. But if you, when you damage your kid, man. Man. Yeah. You're setting, you're like creating a string of decades. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe decades of destruction. They, they will do the same to their kids, <clears throat> and it's also it sort of reflects how selfish, selfish or selfless you are. You know, whether you do a good job or a shitty job. You know, I've, you know, I've unfortunately I have some friends that are not that good at it, and you know, comics in particular. Like there was a. I don't want to say any names, but there's a guy who was friends with the son of a famous comedian. Let me track that for a minute. And uh, a guy who I know who grew up with the son of oh, a very yeah, famous I got it, I got comedian. It. Sometimes I get confused when people talk about like yeah. my cousin's brother's uncle. Yeah. yeah, I know I'm with you. And he was telling me that his dad was a piece of shit and he, he hated him. And I'm like, God damn, your dad's one of my heroes. Yeah, it's yeah, hard. Yeah. When you talk to the actual son of the man and he's like, yeah, my dad's a piece of shit. And I'm like, fuck. Like, I don't know what to do with that. You know, like, what do I say? To, I mean, his art is amazing, is, is what he did to the world. I mean, but what he didn't do was take care of his own backyard. What he didn't do is take care of his own children. I find that that <clears> creates <throat> some difficulty because there's some writers, not some, I mean, so many of them, writers, musicians, um, actors who have uh, blessed the world with what they've put out. But then you look at the destruction they sowed in their immediate vicinity. Yeah. And you want to be like, well, do you condemn it? Or are you just thankful that, or is that like collateral damage? Unavoidable collateral, collateral damage in order to have the things that, to have the things that we appreciate. Yeah. Well, there's also. Do you, do you kind of follow what I'm saying? hundred percent. Well, Hendrix. You know, I mean, this podcast, this podcast was called the, the Joe Rogan Experience because I stole it from Hendrix. Oh, really? Yeah. That's funny. I was just thinking about that earlier when I was sitting in your your uh, in the back room there, and yeah. you had that. I was just looking at the experience, wondering about where that came from. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix experience. Yeah, it's one hundred percent. I stole it from Hendrix, <laughs> um, and then I read that he beat his girlfriends. Really? Like, yeah. I was like, what? Is that real? Like, I don't want to think Hendrix even got mad. I want to think he's that dude who put the bandana on and just played voodoo child. You yeah. Know? When uh, I worked with Phil Hartman, when Phil Hartman was a kid. I think he was like 17 or 18. Hendrix played at the whiskey and uh, he was there uh, as like a roadie. And his job was to keep the amp, uh, the speakers from falling over, you know? So he stood there on the stage and Hendrix was right there playing guitar in front of him. Yeah. And the, the way he described it was like his eyes were alight. He was like describing, like, it was like he was right there. He was right there and he's playing, you know? There's been, I grew up, but. Just a giant Hendrix fan. Like a giant fan of Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, The Doors. Like it's all classic rock when I was a kid, you know? Yeah. Suburban Boston neighborhood type shit. You draw Van Halen on your fucking notebook, that kind of <laughs> shit. <laughs> AC D C logos. You know, it's like that's that's how I grew up. You know, so I was trying to figure out a name for this podcast. I was like, man, who the fuck is affected me more in terms of motivation than Hendrix because I'd listen to his music when I worked out I'd listen to his music oh, that's great driving to gigs you know and plus he just seemed like so different you know just such a, a crazy anomaly in pop culture this 
African American dude is like the greatest guitarist of all time. Like you have all these rock guys, and one of the things that Eric Clapton had said, like he thought he knew how to play guitar, and then he saw Jimi Hendrix, and he was like, "What the fuck? I don't am realize I he did Like, what am I doing? Yeah, because you know, he was just so out there. He was so out there. He was so different. You know, just a freak, just an anomaly. It's like hunting with Remy Warren. <laughs> I'm glad you guys got him doing a podcast. It's great. I love it. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, Hendrix. I always point out to people that how I grew up. Uh, my dad discovered that I was left eye dominant, dominant, and uh, all the hand me down shit guns were always right handed. But I had to relearn how to shoot everything left handed. So now I talk about how I was like Hendrix, where I had to shoot left handed with right handed guns. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shot my first deer with your gun, so left handed gun. Your rifle. I had to cock it on the wrong side, remember? No. Yeah. I, <laughs> I believe you. Your <laughs> rifle. The, it's out there, man. The deer's here. Yeah. Yeah, where did it, it lost its position of uh, prominence. This, this is Nazi you helmet. You the table. <laughs> yeah, the Nazi helmet, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it used to be right there. Hey, did you, did you see, uh, I don't want to change the subject, but I do want, uh, did you see the video I sent you? Which one? Of the shark tagging the dude, the Instagram video. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, which one? Let me see. I've seen. That's one of the things. That, this yeah, is so crazy. I get so many of those goddamn things sent to me. No, I thought you'd appreciate it. I'm sure. Of a guy getting, uh, I don't know what kind of shark it is. Yeah, I'll send it to Jamie. What kind of shark is it? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a bull shark. Maybe I'm not sure. Oh yeah, here it is. I was almost dinner. He says, "Yeah, here, share too." Oh, that was, yeah. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> it's fucking terrible. It's terrible. I'm I'm terrified of sharks. Do you think it's, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I thought you'd appreciate it. Yeah. Because the where, the, 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 the um, mental presence of that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he kept it together. Yeah. Just to like, he's getting attacked by a shark and puts, not only thinks to put its spear gun in its mouth. Here it is right here. But pulled the trigger. Boom. Suck it, bitch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, that thing was coming in hot. That's amazing. And That's he, some sharp thinking. And he's attached to this fucking shark now, right? Yeah, but he stones it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's dead. That's hilarious. <clears throat> yeah, fuck sharks. I wish there was more of them so you could say fuck sharks and not worry about it. Yeah, now you can't. <laughs> um, it's funny, man. Like, you were talking about sharks. You hear about guys... Uh, they fish the Gulf Coast in Florida and shit, and you got to be very careful because uh, pulling a shark up on the beach, people will get pissed. Oh, yeah. And they'll get pissed that you're fishing sharks because it lures sharks in. Oh, so it's a double whammy. Yeah, sharks have kind of entered, like, they've almost gotten, like, um, they've climbed, they, they've sort of moved in how we view wildlife. They've yeah. made the jump. They're up there with elephants. Yes, yes. <laughs> they like almost. It's almost. great news Giraffes. for a species, man. Yeah. If I was a different species, and I was trying to like make my plan, my three-year plan, I'd be like, I want to elevate my species up to. I want to look at like what the sharks done and get there. <laughs> Because that shit, that's where safety lies. Right, like if you were an entertainer and you wanted to get to, I want to get to where Kanye is. Like if you were an animal, I want to get to where the sharks yeah. are. Like that's if I was a spot. possum, yeah. if I was a possum, I'd get with other possums and I'd be like, what does it take to get to um, what an elephant enjoys? I was discussing with my kids Because right now night. people are, they, they, people don't consider possums. No. <laughs> They're they like. Hit them with a car. No one yeah. cares. People are like, oh, it's just a grinner. Just keep moving. Yeah. I was talking to my kids last night about racism in the insect world and that uh, we were we we're hanging out outside and uh, my youngest daughter goes, oh, it's a roach. Oh, it's a cricket. <laughs> and turns her back on this thing. Like has no concern at all. She goes from being, ah, ah. oh, it's a cricket. I mean, and just turns her back. Same size, like, you know, same prospect of danger. There's none. It's just wandering around. She thought it was a roach, and she was terrified, and then it was a cricket. I find crickets in my house all the time. I capture them, and I let them go. Yeah. I bring them outside, I let them go. So we do this. Um, we, you know, this cricket is hanging out behind my daughter, 
And uh, then my dog comes over and just fucking scoops it up and eats it. <laughs> and we're like, hey, man, why the fuck are you eating a cricket? <laughs> He's like laughing and smiling. He thinks it's hilarious. It's like, fuck, man. He's ate a cricket. Yeah, we, uh, the, the racism, the species or whatever is, uh, <laughs> you know, we used to have a rat infestation. What um, is this, Jamie? What do you got here? Is the dog going to eat that bird? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that bird was like, hello, friend. Jamie's one of the better internet uh, thing finders. He's the best. I got one more He's got a gold medal. What do you call so that? It's like stuff finding, oh, internet that, finding. Yeah. Have you seen that cat? Yeah, I've seen that cat. Crazy. Somebody sent me that. Dude. That's a muscular Yeah, cat. he's rippled. That cat looks like he's been running mountains. It's he's bad. been taking down some elk. <clears throat> yeah, he's ripped. You I know, like um, you had, uh, was it your podcast? I, I mean, I know you had um, uh, Elk 101. What is his name? No. Nope. Corey Jacobson? Nope. You Jason have, Phelps. Oh, that's right. Yep. That's right. All right. Different guy. Phelps Game Calls. Right. I love that guy. Dude. Yeah. Great podcast, too. Well, he's a good, he's a good guy for You've never reasons. had Corey Jacobson on? No, no, sir. Okay. Never met him. I'd like to. I haven't met him. I'd like to, too. Uh, Phelps. Uh, yeah. Like, one, just as an isolated specimen. Okay. Like, an, like no context, nothing. If you just, like, met him because whatever. You like want to trying to park at the airport and you're trying to find a spot and he's pulling out and you're like, hey, you pulling out? Like you'd like him in that context. He would just seem like a good dude. But kind of his business, it's kind of when I see him and his company, like there's a thing that always pops in my head was uh there's this term like 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 American elbow grease. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Let's tell people like what he, he does. He makes elk calls. Yeah, he makes well, a game wide calls. variety of game calls, but he's spe- calls. like he, he's like very much specialized in elk calls. But it's like grew up in a logging family, um, you know, in, in like a logging area, and that industry at this particular time is you know, a, little, a little bit in the autumn of its of its life expectancy in the area where he grew up. But that's kind of his background. And this dude is like interested in something, good at something. Remember talking earlier, like being an American, you know, the benefits of being an American. Yeah. Um, not that we have a monopoly on it, but we have a lot of it, just like great benefits. And this dude just like starts making game calls. And like with his mom and his wife, like builds a business, man. And is a good dude. He, you know, is, it's called blowing a game call, right? So he sends me his t shirt that says, I blow Phelps. <laughs> and uh, my wife is like, throw it out. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those things she goes you're never gonna wear it I'm like it doesn't matter I'm, it stays he's the nicest guy that, like <laughs> you know when you always say like someone's the nicest like you know, you know yeah. you say like oh he's the nicest guy like I don't know I value that that means no, everything just like to me. such a good yeah. dude I, I lose a lot of respect for people when they're really good at what they do but they're not nice it's like I get it you had to figure out how to be good at what you did and what sa- was sacrificed is community yeah. you, sac- you, you sacrifice friendliness that's not necessary yeah it's not necessary it's it's a weakness i really believe that you know and um it's uh it's common it's common weakness it's like the thinking of yourself before others the problem is it's goal oriented right you're all you're worried about achieving success or achieving a, a certain position or a goal but the problem is when you get to that goal you're going to be fucking de- you're going to be depressed you're going to be sad because you don't have any friends <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you that's an interesting over point. your way to the top you know it's like you can't you can't you have to see the the trees you got to see everything you got to see the whole forest you can't just keep your eye on the prize because you fuck over people and push them aside along the way and eventually you're gonna get but you have to fuck over some people and i don't mean fuck them over but tell them to fuck off like there's some people that will get in your way people that are selfish that will trip you up because you'll wind up being completely absorbed in their own problems and you're like hey you're not dealing with your own problems you've made me the curator of your problems Sometimes you have to like know when to cut people loose, but you also have to like. I know I know that you're big on this too. You're you're big on tribe, like you have like those guys that you travel with, or you do shows with. This is like a tribe of you, like you have yeah. a community, and it's very important. I respect that. I think that's very that's huge. So that's like, a th- but it's a thing I've learned from uh, my interactions with you, and a thing I've seen is. Uh, you don't you don't parade it around and you don't talk about it too much, but you do talk about that there are some things where you just you you put up some firewalls 
in your life and the people that you're around. And I have heard you refer to at times that, that something got too, someone was maybe like too damaging and referring to people that, that it wasn't even like you were condemning them or thought they were bad, but you just referred to like times when you've had to like just sort of protect what you had and what, what you care about and just make some things not part of your life anymore. Yeah. You have to do that sometimes. Yeah. You have to, you have to realize that there's some people that are not looking out for themselves. Some people don't make that jump well and they keep that around. Yeah. They keep that, that influence around because they, because of maybe like misplaced loyalties. Yes. But I've noticed you bring that up a handful of times where you're like, something just got to be where you had to like build, you just, you had to be like, you know, I love you, respect you, whatever, but I just can't, I got to protect these other things. Well, some people get completely self-absorbed and they burn everything around them. Because they're only thinking about themselves. And even if you love them and care them or l appreciate what they're doing, like some people are amazing at certain things. Like, you know, we were talking about Hendrix. I mean, if Hendrix did beat his wife, I don't know if that's true, or beat his girlfriends. Yeah. But it's like some people are so good at what they do that, like, that's all they're thinking about. And they didn't develop these interpersonal skills or relationship skills or, you know, uh, Whatever it's, you know, they didn't develop a, a, a sense of nuance in terms of their perspective of the world, or uh, a sense of uh, introspective thinking when they're, they're looking at themselves and being objective about how they interface with the people around them and and life. Those people that are just like wholly focused on the self, especially pure narcissists, which you run into a lot of them in show business, and some of them, it's not their fault you know you, you talk to them if you believe in determinism you know and you believe that they're a product of all the things that have happened to them and then you run down the list of all the things that have happened to them it's fucking bone chilling i mean so many people that i know particularly in show business are there because of just a giant hole that they developed in their self-esteem and their who they are as a child they didn't get enough love they got too much abuse and hate and bullying and all these varying factors that made them push so hard to achieve success to let everybody know hey i am special hey i am something you were all wrong and then they but along the way they they burn everything around them yeah and it's i don't i don't you know i mean, i, I don't want to it's it's possible to get there without that that's what i want to say it's like it's possible to get there without being a piece of shit and some people think you have to be a piece of shit to be successful you don't don't have to or i think some people get to where remember earlier i mentioned uh like the collateral damage yeah uh, some people think have you could develop such an inflated sense of what you're bringing to the world that you ex you personally come to accept the idea that there is a price to pay yeah that price being other people yeah yeah that's a problem but then again if you don't have certain standards then other people will chew up all your time and their problems become your problems, and they're not even thinking about their problems. They're thinking about you thinking about their problems. I mean, there's many people that pawn off their problems on other folks, and they think that if you're a good friend, you're helping me. Like, you're not a good friend. You're not taking care of me. You're not helping me. I'm like, you're not even helping yourself. Yeah. The fuck are you doing for yourself? Like, this is a, a trap that a lot of people get stuck into. It's codependency. It happens in a lot of relationships. There's a lot of people that get involved in relationships, boy and girl that they find that the person who is their their soulmate is also the source of all their fucking problems and they're the curator of this person's life they're the, they're supposed to be like helping this person along because this person is like deemed them the person who's most important to them and it's like you got to you got to find you got to find out what you know what, what is the what's the boundary where you won't cross where yeah. you realize like someone is becoming an impediment to your own happiness and success. It's amazing the degree to which people deep down do care about, um, what someone is quote like, you know, mm -hmm. where I find that because I've been on your show a number of times, um, people are curious about you and people will often ask me, Oh, you know, what's Rogan really like? But they know they know the they know what answer they want to hear bad. People would love a story. Okay. You think of something like Oprah Winfrey. I've found that people love a story about how bad like people are gonna eat up a story that she's awful. Yeah. They're like, yeah. For sure. Like people want a story about somebody being bad, but what's funny about what you've done and how you've done it is that, and this happens quite often, where people are like, 
they're like, he's a good guy, right? <laughs> like they want to know. Like they feel like you are and they want to have it confirmed. Not that they're like, oh, yeah, tell me a story about him being bad. Like they would with a lot of people. If someone has a really bad story about Oprah, I'm like, oh, I'm all ears. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Of course. Why? Of course. Well, well, I think, first of all, because Oprah is enormously successful, like in some sort of preposterous way. She's yeah. worth a billion dollars for just talking. She can't sing. She can't dance. She's not in good shape. Like, What is she doing? She's just talking. She's got a billion dollars. Fuck her. I hope she's, I hope she's a meanie. I hope she's doing terrible things. Yeah, you know, yeah. so there's a thing about that. It's like you want to find out, oh, she got that way because she's fucking people over. Yeah, I heard she beats her assistant. I heard she, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I heard she lit her sister's house like on it made, fire. Like it makes sense in the world yeah. in some yeah, way. Yeah, in some ways, like you want to think that someone who's achieved that ridiculous level of success is mean. Like I passed by, Oprah, Oprah has a house in Montecito. I passed by the house like that is a ridiculous house for a person. It's like a g- giant lawn, fifty million dollar house, a fucking huge estate. It's a castle. She's a queen, you know. You don't want that. Like fuck her, you know. Yeah. My house is two hundred fifty grand. <laughs> Why? Is, what the fuck is she doing with that fifty? And that's not even a house she lives in. She just visits that like once a year, takes a shit there, has someone cook for, her, takes a nap, gets up, S- stirs and animosity. Stirs an yeah. animosity. Yeah, well, uh, you know, preposterous success breeds animosity, and that lady's got a lot of preposterous success. You know, so there's, there's certain people, you meet them, you want them to sell, like Dr. Phil, like uh, he's a similar thing. I would be receptive to a bad Dr. Phil story. Yes, I'm sure. He's great. Dr. Phil is fucking great. My friend Jay is Dr. Phil's son. I became friends with Dr. Phil through another guy, through another guy, because my friend Ron White. My friend Ron White is a good buddy of mine. He's one of the best comedians on earth. Is good friends with Jay, yeah. with Jay McGraw, who's Dr. Phil's son. So I became friends with Jay before I became friends with Dr. Phil. And then I had Dr. Phil on the podcast. Dr. Phil's the fucking nicest guy ever. He's a regular guy. Like you hang out and talk to him. He's got a ridiculous amount of success, but he's hilarious. He's like a regular dude. Yeah. Before we started, we talked about how we're both pro-marriage. Yes. We root for marriages. Right, but with kids. Yeah. But marriage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when there's no kids involved. I still root for them. Yeah. Do you? No, I root for marriages. I, I, I root for happiness. And sometimes happiness means divorce. No, I root. Well, or absolving. I, I, I'm able to make the switch by even root for marriage. I just root for marriages. I don't know why. That's it. Well, because you, I know why. Because you grew up in a fucked up sort of situation where it didn't, you know, you grew up with broken promises and divorces and separating and that kind of shit. A lot of that had yeah. happened. Yeah. 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 There was stuff that had happened. Well, for children, not for me, but it was, there was like it was around, right? And yeah. it was in it was yeah. in our family history for sure. sure. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, I'm, I I root for happiness. Sometimes happiness means someone getting the fuck away from somebody. You know my favorite story about um, people being a good guy? Mo, I mentioned Mo Fallon earlier. He's been on the show, so I feel like I can mention him, um, assuming that your listeners like have this like amazing capacity for Some retention. Some of them do. But, so Mo <laughs> Fallon's been on the show. And Mo Fallon talks about, dude, this is like a third, this is like a fifth-hand story. But Mo Fallon's buddy meets the guy that uh, used to be like, Who's the dude in, in the Nerds movie who'd go like, Nerds? Oh, yeah. Who was Ogre? that guy? Ogre, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Check this out. Wow, what a fucking so, reference. So, Moe's buddy meets the dude who was Ogre in the Nerds. And Nerds, not the Nerds. Nerds. It's like a fucking old man. So, And the guy like doesn't want to bring it up, but he can't help himself but bring it up. He's like, you know, I loved you in Nerds. <laughs> so... The guy goes into this big thing like, he's like, do you have any idea what it would be like to have like your whole life defined by some role you did long ago? And I'm a thespian and I do theater now. And you people that bring this up all the time, oh, nerds, you know, and he does it. Like he like is cool with it and rolls into it. And the dude's relief that he enabled him to like have that recollection. Mm. You know, that he was always like, yeah, okay, people are going to look. And when I hear that now, if I see that guy, I'm like, that guy must be a cool guy. <laughs> right, because he doesn't take himself too seriously. Yeah, because he could roll with it. Yeah, there he is. Nerds. 
<laughs> was it? Did he do pro wrestling or something? Uh, maybe. Yeah. What's going on there? No, I think that's Ranger of the Nerds. Oh, that's movie the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, looks like a guy that you would cast in a role, a role where he'd be mean to nerds. Yeah, some people take themselves fucking super seriously. Like that's one of the best things about uh, my career is like I'll, I will for always be forever always be the fear factor guy. Like if I, I don't ever, think that that's true. Ah, it's definitely true with some folks. Really? Yeah, you can watch it. <laughs> it's on TV. I mean, you can still no, I understand that, but I don't it. know that. I don't know that that's really the case with you. I feel like that you might have a wrong impression of your of your legacy. Uh, it's in there. It's definitely in there. It's in there, but it's not it. Maybe it's not it, but if anybody wanted to like, poke fun at me, that's always there. And I would welcome it. Like, I, don't think right that, I, don't, I don't think that happens. Well, it would prevent me from taking myself, my, myself and my, you know, I want to pretend I'm some sort of moody artist that has always followed the path of uh, creativity and artistic expression. No. No, I hoard myself out for like six years. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in your head, but I don't think it's in people's head. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's in some people's heads. I can sure. remember the first place I ever. You know what? You know what helps substantiate what you're telling me. I know where I was sitting the first time I ever heard your name. I know who I was talking to. And unfortunately, I don't like to admit this. This is a long time ago. Unfortunately, the point of contact when I was like, "Oh, you're right." Fear factor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Fucking millions of people saw that goddamn thing. I need to tell you, too, that that was the first conversation when I ever heard the word podcast. Really? I know where I was sitting. I was talking to Helen Cho, who you know. Oh, yeah. I heard the word Joe Rogan and the word podcast and had no idea what either of those things were. That's before you came on. Dude, yeah. I'm talking a long time 2012. ago. 2012. People, did, yeah. Yeah. I'm not like. I'm not, I mean, I have, I don't want to say I have my finger on the pulse, but I'm not like a Luddite. Well, that, that was when I heard the word. The podcast was only three years old back then when you first came on. Now it's 10 years old. Not crazy? I think it was longer ago than that. It was 2012. Okay. Because that's when we went hunting. Maybe in 2011 yeah. and we went hunting in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So it was probably two years old. The podcast was two years old. And she said, fear factor. I'm like, oh. <laughs> The world, the world of podcasting, man, there was a funny Variety article that was just written that Conan O'Brien is blazing a trail in the world of podcasting and, you know, just got just openly shit on by the entire world who read that. Like, what are you talking about? Like, no one's even, like, his podcast gets like 100,000 downloads or something in, in, in comparison to like Mark Maron or Adam Carolla, all these people that have been doing it forever and ever yeah. and ever. But it's, uh, it's still to this day, like this sort of... In mainstream views, in mainstream eyes, it's like just starting to gain recognition. When some people like Corolla has been doing podcasts for 10 years. And I think Marin has been doing it longer than me. I've been doing it for 10 years. So Marin's probably 10, 11 years in. You know, it's a, it's a weird world. And how many years have you guys been doing it now? Five? Yeah. Five years in? Yeah. I, I listen to your goddamn podcast every week. I get Do excited you? on Monday. Monday's my you know Sunday. Day. Yes, that's Fuck nice yeah. of you, man. Yeah, I really enjoy great. doing it, and, and and I've tried to point out, um, I've tried to point out that, uh, yeah, if it wasn't for you, I hadn't, I, I wouldn't have gone into it. Well, you were really good as a guest, and I was like, man, this guy has so much unusual knowledge in his head, and you're so good at articulating thoughts, and you have a background in journalism. You're, you're so eloquent. Like, why wouldn't you do it? I'm like, it's so easy. And there's like this market for it. For people that enjoy hunting and enjoy the outdoors, there's, you know, there's, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody who's making podcasts, do your best. But there's a lot of clunky, uh, poorly articulated thoughts that are being put out in podcast form. And my, my thought was like, this is... Um, so the word spiritual is a very weird word, right? Um, because it's been sort of co-opted by assholes. But there's this- Has it? Yeah, sometimes. In LA, for sure. There's a lot of bead wearing oh, dipshits. Oh, yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm yeah, with you. You know, but there's a spiritual aspect to hunting. It's real, you know? And one of the things that I really appreciate about you is like this idea, like no shooting collared deer speaks to it. It's like- 
there's there's something about this that's not just about shooting an animal and eating it. It's about the difficulty difficulty of the pursuit, what it means, and what you're getting out of it as a human being, and then also the recognition of what you're eating. That when you're eating this animal, that this is a this is a, a wild, beautiful creature that you respect, and that there's a certain amount of like. There's a certain amount of a feeling of loss and sadness when that animal dies. And this is, this is recognized and this is real. And it's hard for people to articulate that. And I think it's very important that there's people like you out there that are articulating this. And that the people can digest this in a podcast form and get it over and over again. And they also get, because you always do these big groups of people, they get a sense of camaraderie too. And where people are talking. And, and there's also like an, a pride of hard work, you know, there's a, there's a pride that comes through that, which I think is very um, contagious. Like this, uh, the feeling of appreciating and respecting hard work and like you were, the way that you were talking about Jason Phelps, you know, it's like that kind of a, that appreciation for ingenuity and hard work. I think it's very important for people. It's very important for people to hear. It gives you something that I, I don't, I, in, in terms of like outdoor, like the outdoor world, like whether it's hunting and fishing and, just appreciation for wildlife, it's, it's not publicly articulated on a broad scale. You know, when you referred to the camaraderie, which is super important to me, uh, when I thought about making a show, um, you know what I always had a lot of, nost- when I thought about making a podcast, you know what I always had a lot of nostalgia for was um, Howard Stern in the mid-90s. Yeah. I don't know what his show's like now. Remember that era when it was um I mean he maybe he might still be on there like he'd have all these dudes around that were kind of like funny. Yeah. And there were so many people in the room you couldn't tell who was talking. It was just like people it felt like people hanging out. Yeah. I liked that and I liked um Fresh Air by Terry Gross. Sure. And I was like, dude, you should do a combo. <laughs> <laughs> Of Howard Stern and Terry Gross, yeah, that was like a thing. I, that was the thing I thought about. But the camaraderie—that's one of the, the one of the things I like to see in most when people write in. They feel like um, they feel like it's that like people sitting around shooting the shit. Yeah, which you know, it's a very uh, controlled shooting of the shit. Sure, has to be. It's controlled. Well, that's why a person like you is important. Like you, there, there has to be one person that sort of is like aware that we're all shooting the shit but sort of like gently guiding it you know opie and anthony was the same thing for me Mm -hmm. when i started doing opie and anthony in like the early 2000s uh i i realized like wow what is this crazy people don't people that weren't fans of it back then it doesn't exist anymore unfortunately it was an amazing hangout for comedians we would all go there and i would I would show up and Ricky Gervais would be there and Jim Norton would yeah. be there and all these guys would be there and Louis C.K. would be there. Bill Burr would be there. We'd just be talking shit and Ari Shafir. We'd all be just laughing and chiming in. And even though it was 6 o'clock in the morning, like you went and did it, man. You had a cup of coffee. You showed up and everybody was happy to see you. And it was a hang. And it was a really loosely structured hang that they put together. And that inspired me to kind of do my podcast in a similar way. I don't know how comfortable you are pulling back the curtain or, or showing like how the sausage gets made. But um, I was talking to someone recently about you and, and sort of how you do your deal. And I was like, if you if you imagine, does this make you uncomfortable? No. Okay. If you imagine that someone, I don't want this to seem like at all negative. If someone read a transcript of your, of what you ask, you wouldn't be like, oh my God. But you bring out things in, in the people that you interview. I like to listen to your show and you get something from people that people don't get. Do you get it on purpose? Uh, like, I don't know what I'm getting. I'm trying my best. You are? Yeah. So I'm trying my best to relate to <laughs> like, people. You, do you like, you know what I'm going to, do you ever say to yourself, you know what I ought to do different? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Th- that's the, the beauty of it all. There's, there's not that much thinking. <laughs> I mean, I do think with some people, like there's certain people like Cornell West. I read his book before he came on. I really wanted to be prepared because he's such a brilliant guy. Yeah. The same thing with like um, uh, Sean Carroll, like uh, scientists, you know, uh, anyone who's like. Yeah, you should get, you're, you're paying respect to the, yes. the complexity I'll, of their ideas. Yes. And I'll, like if say someone like um, 
like Richard Dawkins, we're talking about doing a podcast soon. If I if I have him on, I will devour his material yeah. for like a week or two beforehand. I will read his books. I will listen to recordings and conversations and debates that he's had. And I already am a big fan of the guy, so I'll get a, a good understanding of like where I'm at when we lead into the conversation. But then I won't have an agenda. I would just like let the conversation flow. And if uh, there's a moment in time where I want to ask him, like, you said this thing about Islam once. Like, do, do, do you? What do you mean? Do you mean this in terms of like a general understanding of the religion itself? What about the individuals that are just trying to be good people that are born into this environment and this sort of a, uh, you know, I will, I, I will have some places to go to if we get stuck. Some things that I will, but I won't, I won't force those things in. Yeah, but I think it's like an. I mean, without with the the risk of sounding pretentious, I think that uh, podcasting is in a weird way an art form, and the art is in like the people listening. Like I know sometimes I talk over people or I interject too much. And uh, no, I disagree. It happens. <laughs> it happens. It just happens. There's no way you can have a perfect conversation because I don't know when the person's going to stop talking, and or I don't want to lose a thought, and I want to jump in with it. But I'm way better at it now than I was five years ago and certainly way better at it now than I was 10 years ago. And then I think that there's, a, there's an art to the way the things you're saying sound and how they sound to people. And there's an art to expression, expressing genuine open-mindedness and genuine curiosity and like just a, a purity of thought. Yeah. Where it does not... There's, you're not trying to make people feel about you a certain way. You're not. You're just trying to explore ideas. And there's a there's a smoothness to the way that's 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 um, devoured by people when people are listening. The way they're consuming it, it's easy. And the easier you can make it on people listening, the more they'll like you. So like the like if they know they're like hey. That Steve Rinella guy, he loves his kids. He's a nice guy. He's, his friends love him. Like, I like that guy. Listen to what he says when he talks to John Norris. You know, what is John saying about this and about that? And like, it, it, it adds to it. Whereas, is there someone who's clunky and loud and they're just fucking, they're just trying to toot their own horn and all that comes through, especially in this long form podcast genre? It's like, this is the fucking mirror, man. Like the, the, with long form podcasts, you find out who the fuck everybody is. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Like, like Bernie Sanders. Like I had Bernie Sanders on. Yeah, There's a lot that. of people that like the fucking comments were insanely positive. They're like, I thought that guy was crazy. <laughs> like yeah. I thought he was a nut. I would see him in these little interviews. I'm like, he just wants to give away everybody's money. Like uh, there was a picture with Bernie with my dog, and uh, one of the fucking hilarious comments, like he just wants to give your dog treats to other dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that's that's the the caricature. I, I mean, everyone has a caricature, right? The character of that guy is he just wants to take money from successful people and give it to lazy people. That's the worst the worst view of Bernie Sanders, you know. And you get to see instead of like this narrative that gets established through these little short sound bites on these panel talk shows with three people talking over each other or debates or whatever it is. All those are ineffective. And what's interesting about it is all those are fueling podcasts. All those things that have so for so long been thought of as mainstream venues for getting your ideas out. Now they highlight all the problems with those and they highlight all the strengths of podcasts. That's encouraging. Yeah, it's very encouraging. And are, you also, Ber- are you a Bernie Sanders man? He's a nice guy. You know, I, 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 I like some of his ideas. I do not have a problem with giving up more of my money as a, a person who's made a lot of money if I know that it's going to benefit the greater good of mankind in a, in a real way. You don't want to see it squandered. I don't want to see it squandered. I don't like bureaucracy. I don't like red tape. I don't like government. I don't like people that are so lazy that they just want to take everybody's money and then do what they will with it and take long lunch breaks. And this is the problem with like a lot of what we think of in terms of like government. Government is filled, it's bloated. It's filled with assholes. It's filled with people that just got government jobs and they're, they're not good at it. 
You know, they just, no one else wants that job, so they take that job, and they do a shitty job with it, and they squander resources. That's what drives people crazy, and especially hardworking people that know how hard it is to make a living. You have to give, you know, if you're a fucking logger, you're going to give away a certain percentage of your money, and you're tired all the splinters in your hands, and you're exhausted, and some asshole is going to take away your money and, you know, allocate a certain amount of it to nonsense. Yeah. You know, gender research and all sorts of s stupid shit that you think is just fruitless and it's just it, it's infuriating for people for hard-working people with dirt under their fingernails they don't want to think about anybody squandering their money yeah i'm instinctively uh yeah fiscally very conservative yeah um not very fiscally conservative people might look at where i'm at and think that i'm socially liberal but in, in social issues i'm somewhat libertarian you know but uh i feel that um I need the right to come my direction quite a long ways on conservation issues. But that's Land. Instinct, that's yes. yeah, that's yes. instinctively where I belong. Yeah. But the the right, but I need them to move back my no when I say back my direction cuz historically, well, I don't know. The right and left's hard to is confusing, but um yeah. I need them to come my way on conservation. Well, I like the way you've described yourself in the past that you're politically sort of uh, alone that you're 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 kind of without a party because the left wants to take your guns away and the right wants to take your land away yeah. and this is what we see fiscally that th what the the most disturbing aspects of uh right-wing administrations is they want to sell off public land they want to figure out a way just a little bit just a little bit we're just take a little bit we're going to use it for mining just take a little bit well we might lose this salmon river but who the fuck is paying attention to that come yeah, on I, yeah we I need pay, land. I, i'm watching yes me too <laughs> and uh, that's uh ryan callahan talked about that with uh, what is it called pebble beach is that what it, no pebble pebble mine, uh, pebble mine. Yeah. yeah that um i mean gigantic salmon fisheries the biggest most yeah, important it's a, it's a yeah deeply un yeah i, I don't want to Get it too hard, but yeah, you can get into the weeds with this stuff. But yeah, it's like there's no perfect party, and there's no perfect politician, and there's no perfect ideology, which pisses people off when you point that out. <laughs> yeah, dude, we've gotten hit hard for that kind of stuff for pointing out that it's just not. Um, you know, we as a company, like at Meteor, we've been like hit hard for pointing out that um, it's unfortunate that someone's not speaking for our holy for our concerns yes well what's interesting about you guys is uh people think that you're some sort of a green trojan horse which is hilarious yeah. i've heard that do we don't I've really like argument. you don't like guns oh dude we don't really like to hunt <laughs> i love it but it's so preposterous dude, I, I, work with, I work crazy. with the hardest yeah i work with the hardest hitting i work with the hardest hitting hunter, hunters Honor. and fishermen that there that there are ever that have ever lived. You don't really like hunting. It's hilarious. No, <laughs> yeah. it's like it some like shows you. some like beltway lobbyists. You don't really like hunting. Oh, is that right? <laughs> it just shows you how silly people are. It's, it's like let's line them up. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Come on, bring your side over here. Let me let me see what you're doing. Yeah, it's it shows you how ridiculous people can be in their their desire to like put people into a, a very small, easily dismissed category. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this is what people love to do. You know. Yeah, that's what you do that, def that drives people crazy is you defy, you're so hard to bucket. I love it. I don't sit around at night thinking about you, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think about you either if it makes you feel comfortable. But I think we need more people like that. that yeah, most, most people would think that I'm conservative, that I'm a Republican or an alt-right or something like that. I vote left on almost everything except gun control. I just don't think that people understand what they're talking about when they're talking about gun control. I don't think they understand the nuances of the Second Amendment or the nuances of taking away people's ability to defend themselves or to hunt or to, you know, to, to own something that may or may not be used against someone else, but they never would use it. It's You don't have the right to tell people what they can and can't have just because some people abuse things. It's like it, this is a, a, a very complex conversation that people on the left want to boil down to guns equal bad. Oh, for sure. It. It's like it's like I don't have them, and I can't understand why someone would. Yes. But um, therefore, I don't know why you would. But at the same time, they're you know, and we're sitting here with a drink. But at the same time, you look at like alcohol, and one could make a very yeah. uh, cogent argument about the overall destructiveness of abused alcohol. For sure. But people, I don't hear a lot of people talking about 
uh, prohibition. No. No, I had this conversation well, I don't with Dan drink, Crenshaw. I don't drink and drive. <laughs> Dan Crenshaw is a congressman who's not for legalized marijuana, you mm. know, but he likes scotch. So we had this weird conversation. I'm like, come on, man, stop. You know, I'm like, when I mean, we're standing in front of an ashtray filled with blunts, I'm like, come on. <laughs> and this, uh, this idea that, like, if you're a marijuana smoker, that somehow or another you're lazy, like, get, work out with me. Come get up with me. Just stop. Just stop that nonsense. I would like to tackle with the, this with you, uh, because I have um, questions about yeah about that being lazy, being a weed smoker. The weed smoking makes me work harder because <laughs> it makes me paranoid. I don't want to be lazy. <laughs> I want to earn my keep. I, w- I don't want people to ever think that I'm slacking. I love it. That's great. That's how I think about comedy. When I think about when I smoke pot, I think about comedy. I'm like, I better get to work. That's good that you get so paranoid, and the paranoia is that you don't work hard enough. Hundred percent. That's all of it. All of it is my what wife I don't gets, deserve. Uh, my wife gets where she thinks not that she's going to pee her pants, but that she has peed her pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most innocuous <laughs> concern when it comes to alcohol or marijuana ever. That's a great one. I wish I only had that one. That would make it so easier to live with. But mine aids productivity. My my fears aid productivity, whether it's exercise, whether it's um, um, you know um, doing stand stand up is a big one, because you don't want to suck, you just don't want to suck, you don't want anybody to pay money and have a bad time. That is the worst feeling in the history of the world. Well, I'm gonna go see it tonight. Yes. If you suck, I'm gonna fucking be like, boo. I'm working hard, dude. I might heckle you, but I've seen people Good heckle luck. you and it doesn't work well. <laughs> They well, don't come out on top. It's not a smart move because you're interrupting a show for your own idea. You're, and people are already rooting for the guy on yeah. stage because when people heckle you, it doesn't work out well for them. Well, occasionally people are rooting for the heckler if the heckler has a good point. Like, some, I, Look, people have heckled me and said hilarious shit, and I'll laugh along with them. <laughs> it's like, as long as we're not filming anything. The real problem is people that want to heckle and you're filming. You know, like you're filming something, like don't heckle. Yeah, dude, you're funny, but you're not funny you'd like yeah. to... Mm. Not yeah. for like posterity. It's alcohol. It's all alcohol. It's so like you, you get a couple of drinks and you're like, I got some funny shit to say too. And you know, you're by your God, girl. you're not the only <laughs> funny one. This bald and I'm not this bald man up here telling me what's funny. Yeah. I know what's funny, <laughs> and I'm not. And sometimes people have good points, but that's the beauty of live performances. You know, you live in this world where from ready start. Who knows what's going to happen? You press start, and like this thing goes off on its own little journey, and you have this idea of what, the way you're going to steer it, and you're you're bringing up subjects, and you're making people laugh. But anything can happen. Anything can happen. Dude, when I saw you last, I saw you in Seattle, and uh, you know, I want to say this, but people, the, the people destroyed this by saying it. We laughed. My wife and I laughed so much. I wish no one had ever pointed this out because people are going to be like, oh, it hurt my stomach. <laughs> it hurt my stomach. People are like, I laughed so much it hurt. I laughed so much I cried. Like, yeah, shut up. But like, we last much. My stomach hurt. My stomach muscles hurt. That's as good as a person could ever get. Yeah, that's the best. The my best s- yeah. Compliment. Of, compliment Literally, I had like stomach. Afterward, we were talking about our stomach muscles, like we we're doing ab. It's like we had been doing a bunch of crunches. Comedy's a crazy art form, man. It's a crazy art form. It was a beautiful. It was like because we're like in the mix of it, man. I mean, we have three kids that are under ten. It's hard. Everything's hard. And we went to see you, and it was just like, we went to see you, we watched your shit, and um, it was just for, you know, for this like glorious whatever, I don't know, 60 minutes, 45 minutes. It was we were just like two people, like, ha- like fucking like having fun. That's the best it was thing really, about comedy. It's yeah. really nice, and laughing at stuff that we thought, what makes it especially fun, and especially... Um, cathartic as we're laughing about stuff that we felt like we're not supposed to laugh about yeah but you have this moment you have this epiphany like oh you know what though it, but it is funny <laughs> it is funny and it's okay because you're with three thousand other people and everyone's drunk yeah, yeah. you're like yeah. oh we're everyone all on the same beer. page yeah. but it is funny yeah but also like this that you can be a good person and laugh at things mm-hmm. that are ridiculous and that you probably shouldn't be laughing at these things are possible no, we loved it. It's the art form of that is the art form of comedy, you know. The, my favorite kind of comedy. My favorite kind of comedy is fucked up. 
I, I mean, I love all kinds of comedy. If somebody like is like a Jerry Seinfeld, do you ever notice? Like, that's great to me. He's an artist. You know, he figures out a way to craft these things you could take your kids to or your grandma. But I'm a Joey Diaz fan. Yeah, I like that kind of. Com- I like Kennison. I like I like Pryor. I like that kind of comedy. I've told you this before, and I've told your listeners this before enough to excuse me. Um, then I don't mean to wrap your own show, but I got to go. But. uh you didn't like this when I said I felt like you didn't like it when I said it before. But your comedy comes from a position. You, I think you didn't like. I think you didn't like this because it sounds um, you, you're you're modest. How do you know if I liked it? It's just like your body language. <laughs> <laughs> your comedy comes from a position of strength. Mm. So much comedy comes from a position of self loathing. Which self loathing is funny. Right. I can't get it up. I can't please my girlfriend. Right. I'm a horrible husband right it comes from self-loathing but to have someone come at comedy from a position of strength is unusual because the formula is that it's self-deprecating i'm so pathetic right but to have comedy coming from an individual who isn't mired in self-loathing is a really fresh angle and I feel like I brought this up to you before, and you you seem to um, yeah, you seem to not dig it. I probably just didn't want to talk about myself. Yeah, I just want, didn't want to talk about comedy because you come much. from a position yeah. of strength. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> eh, it's fine. It's just jokes. If you That's came from a position of self loathing, you would have luxuriated in the compliment, yes. right? Probably I'm like, well, thank you. <laughs> wow, I never thought about it that way. I guess I'm okay. Yeah, I guess I'm okay. Yeah. So yeah. there's a compliment for you. It's tricky business. Um, you you got to go. You're filming some shit with Brian Count today. Yeah. When are we getting together? What are we doing? Come on, man. Well, it's I think been a we need. Well, I know. And when I, was the last I, time we well, hunted? I, you, was I, it turkey hunting or was it Alaska? Turkey. But I, if you remember, I proposed you not long ago. I was asking you about your availability to hunt elk in September, but it yeah, kind of petered I have out. Two. I have two hunts. I have no. one. I see. I have. The, that's the thing about having kids and a family and everything like that. But what I, I would like most is to bring you and your family up to my fish shack for a few days. Let's do it. Because Let's I think our children. Let's do that. Our Maybe. kids are our kids like kids. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. I'm into that. My and like I said, my youngest fucking loves fishing. We'll have a great time. It'll be good. Steve Rinella, ladies and gentlemen, meat eater, meat eater, uh, bourbon coming soon. Elk Shank in the house. Uh, the meat eater podcast pairs is with Elk Shank. Meat eater podcast everywhere um, and live tours. You guys are doing live podcasts everywhere, which I enjoy as well. Great, thank you. Bye, everybody.